you don't have an attorney, I'm going to ask you if you have an attorney, and I'm going to suggest to you that you accept the, the appointment of an attorney or hire a private counsel. You can hire a private attorney at any point along the way and substitute for uh, an appointed attorney. So you're never going to be, you're not going to uh, lose anything by accepting an appointment. But what I will do at that point is go ahead and enter a denial or a not guilty plea. Um, most of you are here on new charges, so uh, a not guilty plea, so that you have a chance to meet with your attorney before you take any kind of substantive action on your case. So with that, we'll begin at the top and uh, begin with Eric Allen. Come forward, and if you come forward and stand at this podium right here. So I should have said that. Would the state announce? Your Honor, this is Mr. Allen before the court on 22 CF 2619. He is charged with violation of driver's license restriction by a habitual offender. Okay, so Mr. Allen, as I just said, you do have a right to an attorney with this. Do you wish to have an attorney appointed? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, so the court will appoint the public defender. The court's going to enter a not guilty plea in your behalf, as I said, and we'll come back, uh, come back in pre-trials on December 27th. Yes, Your Honor. At seven at nine a.m. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Amber Barrow. Come to the podium, please. You're going to announce the case, Ms. Etheridge? Yes, Your Honor. Casey Etheridge for Amber Barrow. We're hearing 22 CF 2602. And uh, Ms. Barrow would like to um, enter a no contest plea of today um, and accept the state's offer. And it's be for on count one, it'd be adjudication withheld. 18 months of probation, cost supervision waived, $515 in court costs, $100 cost of prosecution, $150 in public defender fees, a substance abuse evaluation, any recommended treatment, and she's agreeing to testify truthfully against the co-defendant, Ernest Goodman Jr., if called to trial. And then on count two, adjudication of guilt, credit for time served. Yes, Your Honor. Right. Ms. Barrow, would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm the information you're about to provide this court is the truth, nothing but the truth, so I hope you got it. Yes, sir. Or yes, Your Honor. So you you heard your attorney state the terms of the plea agreement, and yes, I sir. see that those same terms are contained in your written plea agreement yes. that you've signed. Yes, Have sir. you gone over all this with your attorney, made sure you had all your legal questions answered regarding this? Yes, Your Honor. Because yeah. you're, you're waiving some valuable legal rights, right, to go to a trial, to contest all this. This will be a final resolution of this case. Do you understand that? Yes, Your Honor. And you're entering into this voluntarily? Yes, Your Honor. And you, do you have any other questions of your attorney regarding this matter? No, sir. Okay. Very good. Based upon that, the court will accept your plea agreement as to count one. There will be a withhold of adjudication, 18 months probation, certain fees and costs that are contained. Importantly, you must... Uh, I have a substance abuse evaluation and follow any recommended. That will be a condition of your probation, so you must do that. Yes, sir. And then you're agreeing to testify against the co-defendant truthfully. And the uh, drug paraphernalia charge will be credit for time served. Yes, okay? sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Defense okay with the score sheet? Yes, sir. No objection. Thank you. Alexander Berrios. Please announce. Casey Etheridge for Alexander Berrios. We're here in 22 CF 2631. 
you know, this is a, um, his arraignment. We'd be uh, entering a plea of not guilty for today and um, setting this to the pretrial conference date. Very good. Enter not guilty and enter, uh, uh, come back on pretrial on 12 28. Jeremy Brundage. Not a trial, so it's not a trial. There's nothing to do with this. You're on the wrong, wrong timing. It's not the time to do this. I don't even know what you're going to do. Whatever you're going to do, this isn't the time to do it. So, Your Honor, I believe this is the um, village victim's mother. You need to be talking to the state, but not, not the court at this point. All I'm doing, I don't know anything about the case, yeah. other than. The charges, and I'm accepting a plea. That's all I'm doing today. So you can't, it's not the time to do it. Okay? Thank you. Jeremy Brundage. The state announce. Before the court on 22 CF 2652, he is charged with possession of controlled substance, uh, possession of drug paraphernalia, and driving while license suspended. Very good. Mr. Brunage, as I said before earlier, you do have right to an attorney. You wish to have an attorney appointed? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. The court will appoint the public defender. The court's going to issue or accept a not guilty plea on your behalf. We'll come back on 1227, pretrial, 9 a.m. Just make sure and be in touch with your attorney in the interim, okay? Yes, sir. Chaybob, Hassan Chaybob, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Did I pronounce that right? Yes, Your Honor. Casey Etheridge for Mr. Hassan Chaybob. I'm not sure how to say it, Your Honor, to be honest. Um, I did file a waiver of appearance in this case, um, and so we'd be asking to set this on the pretrial docket, Your Honor. So you're entering a not guilty? Yes, Your Honor. I apologize. Yes. Court will enter a not guilty plea. Come back on 12 27. Yes, Your Honor. Thank 9 you. 9 a.m. Horace Durden. Casey Etheridge for Horst Durden, Your Honor. We'd be entering a not guilty plea for today and setting this for the next pretrial conference date. Court will enter a not guilty plea and we'll come back on 12 27 9 a.m. <coughs> Ernest Goodman. Ms. Flowers case. Ms. Flowers here? I didn't see her. Don't, don't pull up Goodman it's because her attorney's not, his attorney's not here yet. Okay. We'll, we'll just pass over that. Maybe somebody could give her a call. Ricky Gallette. It's the for Mr. Gallette. We're here in 22 CF 2664. And we'll be entering a plea of not guilty for today and setting this for the pretrial conference docket. Very good. The court will enter a not guilty plea and we'll come back on 12 27, 9 a.m. Okay? Sir. James Ham. Mr. Williams. Jay Williams from Mr. Ham will be entering a plea of not guilty, requesting trial by jury in 15 days to file any pre arraignment motions. Mr. Ham, you need to call my office, make an appointment to meet with me. Yes, sir. Court will enter the not guilty plea here today. <coughs> Come back for pre trial on 12 27. Thank eight. you, Judge. Mandy Helms. All right, sir. State announce on this. Yeah, he'll need to call. Judge, it looks like Ms. Helms is representing herself at this point. I believe so. Let us know. Miss Helms, Mandy Helms. 
Ms. Helms, if you're here, you need to stand up and approach. Your Honor, that's 22 CF 2618. The state would request a uh, capius with no bond. We'll issue a no bond capius. Henry Jackson. Mr. Jackson's in jail, Judge. I did see him yesterday. He's coming. Mr. Williams, could you announce the case, please? I sure will, Judge. Uh, State of Florida versus Henry E. Jackson. Case number is 22 CF 2466. Uh, Mr. Jackson's charge with possession of controlled substance will be entering a plea of not guilty on his behalf and request 15 days for any prearrangement motions. Very good. The court will enter a not guilty plea and we'll come back on 1228 for pretrial. Yeah, all right, I want to announce at this time. I don't I'm, I don't want him to represent me no more. I mean, we, we had a big conversation when he came to see me. My Mr. family didn't give me a lawyer today, so Mr. I... Mr. Jackson, you've got, it, you've got an attorney. If you wish to file a Nelson hearing, you need to file something. And we'll call it up for a hearing. You have a right to it, but it's not the right time to do it because we got a whole room full of stuff. I'm just but you can't just do it on the... It's not an oral motion. R Rodney Johnson. Only they went along with the 90. Cool. Judge, we have a negotiated plea in this case. Okay. If I can approach. You may. Thank you. <laughs> I would appreciate it. Go ahead. Once you, if you'll announce the plea terms, and I'll try and follow along and see if I can decipher it. Um, Judge, what I may need to, to do then is approach and do some of it from up there. Uh, this is State of Florida versus Rodney D. Johnson, case number 4622CF675. Uh, uh, he's charged with third degree felony, uh, driving while license suspended, third or subsequent conviction. Um, Judge, we've negotiated a plea in this case for 90 days county jail and credit for time served. There would be an adjudication of guilt. Um, and then uh, the standard fines and court costs, um, $100 cost of prosecution, $100 public defender uh, case resolution fee, $50 public defender application fee. The one other thing that I'd add to it is he has similar charges in Santa Rosa County. Uh, I'd ask that the court allow him to finish uh, his jail sentence in Santa Rosa so that he can be transported over there and begin resolving that case. I don't really understand the request. I don't want him to have to wait here until he finishes this sentence before he goes to Santa Rosa and get the <coughs> process of getting that case resolved. The Is that way my that call here? Where it's handled? When it's handled? No, Judge, but... I was trying to figure out exactly what you're asking. I mean, I understand practically what you're asking, but... I'm asking Take that me. you authorize that the jail sentence that's been imposed here today. Now, he'll, of course, get credit for time served. I think he's probably got about 30 days now. Um, but that the remainder of it can be served in the Santa Rosa County Jail so that, Okalu or so that Santa Rosa can come over and pick him up and take him back to Santa Rosa. He can get on the docket to resolve the Santa Rosa case there. Otherwise, I don't think they're likely to do it. At least this is the way that we used to handle it. I don't know that the jail here would even agree to do that. I believe we've done it before. 
Um, I've done it on several cases before where they have cases in other counties, the whether they're misdemeanors or felonies in those other counties. We've generally just on the record gotten a no objection from the state or the judge to say that they can go serve their time and Okaloosa County Jail will coordinate with whichever other county it is um, in order to transport if they transport early and serve their time in another county. Do you have any objection? State has no objection. I have no objection. I don't know what that means, but. <laughs> I know. I don't know. I mean, you say authorize or order. Those words have actually have meaning, but I'm okay. I'm not opposed to it. So whatever that means, go with it. Thank you, Judge. I okay. appreciate it. Okay. We, we can only do what we can do. Uh, Judge, should I give you a copy of the score sheet? No, you didn't. All right. Um, Judge, here's a copy of the score sheet. I went over the score sheet with him uh, last night. We have no objection to the score sheet. Okay. Yeah. It looks like it's 21.4 total sentence points. Okay, thank you. Puts him in a non-state prison cell. Right. So, Mr. Johnson. Yes, sir, Your Honor. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you yes, swear sir. or affirm the information you're about to provide this court is the truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do, yes, sir, Your Honor. Okay. <laughs> so, you heard your attorney state the term, you can put your hand down. You heard your attorney state the terms of this of the plea agreement? Yes, sir, Your Honor, I did. And if you can read his writing, it, it also, the, the plea agreement is contained in this written plea agreement. Is, are you, did you understand what he was saying? Is that what your agreement is? Yes, sir, I agree okay. to the 90 days. In, yes, 90 sir. days in the county jail, credit for time served. That's the key part of it, plus yes, all the fees and costs. Yes, sir, Your Honor. That are contained in there. Do you understand by doing this, you're waiving the right to go to a trial? Giving up those rights to contest this, say none of this happened. Yes, sir. You Your understand Honor, that? You believe it's in your best interest to uh, to I accept do this it's plea? In my best interest. Okay. Yes, sir. Very good. Based upon that testimony, the court will accept the plea agreement, uh, adjudicate you guilty, and sentence you to 90 days in the county jail. You will get credit for time served, plus all the fees and costs that are contained in the plea agreement. Thank you, sir. And, and Judge, if you'd like, I'll read them into the record. I can read my handwriting. What's There's that? Nobody else on earth can. I can read the signs and what costs. Are that's all right. No, that's all right. It's, it's in there. All right. Thank that's you, good Judge. Uh, 180 days after he gets out of jail to pay. From this jail? He's, he's in 90 days in the Okaloosa County Jail. When that sentence is completed, He'll have 180 days to pay, or it'll go to collections. Okay, that worked. Council, everybody agree on fine, that one? Okay. Shirley Jones. She's coming. Would the state announce? Your Honor, this is Shirley Jones. She's before the court on 22 CF 2582. She is charged with felony petty theft. Ms. Jones, you do have a right to an attorney with these new charges. Do you wish to have an attorney appointed? Yes. Okay. So the court's going to appoint the public defender. The court's going to enter a not guilty plea in your behalf to protect your rights. We'll come back on 1227 for your pretrial at 9 a.m. In the meantime, you need to meet up with your attorney and okay. uh, talk about your case, okay? He's right okay. there. Come over with him for a second. Heather Kelly. He's going to swab your cheek, ma'am. That's all. I'm sorry, Judge. I didn't hear the the name of the defendant. Heather Kelly. Kelly. No, the new one, the one I just did. Yes, sir. Heather Kelly. Is Heather Kelly here? State. Your Honor, the case number is 22 CF 2604. The state would request a capious. No bond. Ordered. Without bond. Jacqueline Lige. Judge Ms. Lige was here earlier. I she met is. With her. She, she is, is here. Come on up, Ms. Lige. This is 22 CF 2598. Judge Ms. Lige is a public defender client. Uh, in fact, I think we had her several days ago in here, and it was passed for today for an information to be filed. They have filed an information. I'm going to enter a plea of not guilty on her behalf. Again, demand jury trial and 15 days for pre-arraignment motions. Very good. The court will accept the not guilty plea. We'll come back on pre-trial on 1227, 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. Damon Magwood. Well, 
22 CF 2653. You announce the case, Council. I sure will, Judge. Uh, this is Damon Magwood, case number 22 CF 2653. Uh, Mr. Magwood, uh, we're going to enter a plea of not guilty on his behalf. Request uh, 15 days for pre amendment motions and uh, demand trial by jury. Very good. The court will enter the not guilty plea. We'll come back on 1228 for pretrial. We'll meet up with you in the interim, okay? I did go out and see him Jay last night. Yeah. I'm sorry? I did go out and see him okay. yesterday. Very good. <coughs> Jalen Martin. Hmm? Your next court date is the 27th of December. 28th. 28th, I'm sorry. 28th right. of December. December 28th is his court date. Hey, Mr. Martin. Mr. Martin, they did uh, finally get information filed in all the cases. Uh, Judge, this is Jalen Martin, case numbers 4622CF2667, 2668, and 2669. On all three cases, the Public Defender's Office has previously been appointed. I'll enter pleas of not guilty, uh, demands for jury trial, and request 15 days for any pre arraignment motions. We will enter the not guilty plea and we'll come back on 1228 for pretrial. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Robert McDonald. We had him this morning, Your Honor. Is that the one this morning? No, mm -hmm. he didn't get his uh, charge. This, is this the, is this, are these new charges? Uh, these said, are new charges? Your Honor, uh, they indicated that he did not get his uh, paperwork this morning. Okay, what paperwork does he need? The information? The, the information, Your Honor. Okay. Yeah, just a copy of the information. Well, yeah, if, if, if he's represented by himself, uh, then he's entitled to one. Did, I'm sorry, Judge, I'm sticking my nose in where it doesn't belong. I'll, I'll yeah. shut up now. That's all right. Um, <laughs> Go ahead, stand over here. Is this a, my question? Is this a different case than the one this morning? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, that's what I thought. This is a new char new case. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. It's the failure to appear charge. Okay. So. Case number 22 CF 2648, it's a failure to appear. Um, wish to have an attorney appointed? No, sir. <laughs> okay. Court, court Leonard not guilty, and we'll come back on 1228 for a pretrial. Yes, sir. I know we're meeting on Monday, and we'll see where everything goes, okay? Okay. Thank you. Earl McKay. Okay. Earl McKay. Okay, so he's not he's not incarcerated. So just for the states, uh, apparently Miss Dudley has filed a notice of appearance and entered a not guilty plea. Waived appearance for today. Ray Mobley is the next case. Same thing? Uh, yes, Judge. He's a public defender case. Um, case numbers 22 CF 2545. Plea is not guilty. Request trial by jury. Uh, we may Was have there a waiver on, for him? Well, and what I'm wondering, Judge, I know that there was one on my list that we would filed a written plea on. This was, yeah, this is this one. We filed a written plea of not guilty. So this has it. been taken off the docket? Okay, very good. Zachary Moore. I'm going to keep up with all the details. He just received this sentence over in Santa Rosa. Defense County. announced. Mm -hmm. This kid did. Okay. I talked to the state. 22 CF 2113. To to that sentence. <clears throat> um, I just talked to him. 
Judge, I tell you what, pass. <clears throat> Give me just one second. Judge, I just got handed something from probation about a sentence Mr. Moore received on something else. And you want to uh, just request whether or not I would potentially do that today. It does call why, for an why adjudication. Why don't we just guilt. pass over? we got plenty of time. All right. Thank Sir, you. have a seat. I'm going to talk to you yes, and sir. give you some advice on this. Um, Ahmad, you guys need him? Yeah. Ahmad Morgan. Oh, well. Do, do we do those prior to an adjudication? Um, pretty much every felony they charge, they have to be swapped. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. We'll go ahead and swallow them then. Yeah. <coughs> so, Ahmad Morgan. The jail didn't do it. I'm sorry, Judge. Um, Ahmad is in uh, incarcerated. Mr. Morgan, uh, Ahmad Mo Morgan? Correct. He's an incarcerated judge, and they haven't brought him out as yet. Okay. Uh, judge, public defender's office has been previously uh, appointed to represent Mr. Morgan in case number 4622CF2597. I'm going to enter a plea of not guilty on his behalf, uh, demand jury trial, and request 15 days for any pre-arraignment motions. Very good. The court will enter a not guilty plea, and we'll come back on 12-28 for pre-trial. Thank you, Judge. <laughs> Latoya Nelson. Judge, uh, Ms. Tel Nelson likewise is incarcerated uh, and has not yet been brought out. No, bring me. You don't have to say that. They know that. There we go. Judge, um, I met with uh, Ms. Nelson yesterday. Um, I've spoken with the state. She's also on for a bond hearing today. The court had revoked her bond because of failure to appear. We've been able to provide a uh, letter of incarceration uh, indicating that she was incarcerated in Gulf County at the time of her failure is to appear. Is this case here today a failure to appear case? Or is there another one? I just want to, I'm not sure. There's not going to be a failure to appear case. We scheduled a bond hearing for this afternoon. And oh, for this afternoon. And the court, the state's just going to stipulate to it since we were able to establish that her failure to appear was not of her own volition. I'm, I'm trying to manage my docket here. Yes, sir. What are we here on in this case? Possession is, of controlled is, substance without is prescription. Is this a, the failure to appear? Is that why we're here? This is a new charge. It's a new charge, Judge. She's charged okay. by information with possession of controlled substance. After the information was filed, she did fail to appear in court on July 28th of this year. But I've been provided documentation that this defendant was incarcerated at another institution. Okay. So I believe defense counsel is asking to reinstate the bond. State has no objection. But for today... We're entering a plea. Are you entering a not guilty plea on that new charge? I, I am, Judge. We have the bond hearing scheduled first. It, it, there was a notice of hearing that was filed. It's on the clerk's docket uh, to address the subject of bond. And so I was simply addressing that. Uh, I don't have a problem with the withdrawal of the failure to appear. Is that the bond? I, I'm just trying to get organized here. You're misreading what I'm, that I'm not trying to address your failure to appear. That's, I'm good with that. I understand. If you're not here in a legitimate reason, you're in jail somewhere, you're not going to get hit for a failure to appear. I am going to um, enter a plea of uh, not guilty on her behalf. Uh, if you guys could make her available to me in a few minutes, I need to explain to her why. Okay. There, that's in 22 CF 1641. That's correct, Judge. Okay, very good. And William Oglesby. Judge, am I understanding correctly the court's reinstating her bond on that case? Yeah. No objection. Yeah. Sure. All right. Judge, I don't have Ms. Oglesby. I'll speak with this gentleman and then come back. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mr. Gibbs. Yes, Your Honor. Tim Gibbs for Mr. Oglesby. He's coming, on, he's coming out as, uh, in just a second. Case number, Judge, this more, or afternoon, it's going to be 22 CF 212516. He also has a violation of probation in 21 CF 802. I, I don't remember if that was specifically on the docket this afternoon. But we are here for a plea day arraignment on the new case. Your, Your Honor, Mr. Oglesby is here. Tim Gibbs on his behalf in that case number. We're going to enter a plea of not guilty this morning and leave this set for pretrial 1228. 
Very good. The court will enter a not guilty plea and will come back on 12 28 9 a.m. for pretrial. Thank you, Your Honor. So we'll be looking into that. Oh, yeah. This, uh, for the, this afternoon or now? I'm sorry? What's the case number on that? Yes, thank you. We'd like that to track. I don't have that on my docket, so I, I don't think mind. he's already had arraignment on that, Your Honor. Okay. Well, we'll uh, try. We need to track them together. That's a good point. Thank you. Okay. Billy Purdue, Billy Wayne. Your Honor, Tim Gibbs on behalf of Billy Purdue on docket this afternoon. Uh, he's coming out of the uh, inmate holding in just a minute. He's here this afternoon on 22 CF 2551. He does also have 22 CF 2768, which is set for arraignment on December 1st. Uh, we'd like to go ahead and enter a not guilty plea um, this afternoon on 22 CF 2551. And I kind of want to go ahead and leave it set for arraignment on 12 1, if that's okay, in case there is some kind of resolution we can reach. Um, leave this track with the other case on that arraignment date. Very good. So we'll 22 CF 2551, enter a not guilty. And we'll come back on this on that case to December one to track with the other one. Thank you, Your Honor. December one. We'll talk if there's anything we can talk about. Marlon Reynolds. Marlon Reynolds. State announced, please. 22 CF 2617. Oh, Mr. Reynolds, you've, uh, based on these new law charges, you do have a right to an attorney. Today's hearing is just a, is a, an arraignment to make a plea, but you do have a right to the appointment of an attorney. Are you going to hire a private attorney or do you wish to have me appoint the public defender? I'm going to hire a private attorney. Okay. When do you, uh, you, you is, is, are uh, you hiring one soon? Uh, soon, this month. Okay. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and enter a not, has the information been filed? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. The court's going to go ahead and enter a not guilty plea on your behalf. So that protects your interest, right? Right. We're going to come back on 1228 for pretrial. Between now and then, you got to get yourself an attorney, okay? Okay. So you can make sure and talk to them before then, and so you can basically start addressing this, okay? Okay. Okay, question? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Christian Rosario. Rosario, correct. State announce. 22 CF 2636. And Mr. Rosario, um, based upon these new charges, you do have a right to have an attorney appointed. You wish to have an attorney appointed, or are you going to hire private counsel? I'm private. Okay. When are you going to? When are you going to hire your attorney? Uh, immediately, right when I get out to get a job, sir, or find me some work, immediately, I'm dead due for a job, immediately. Why don't we do this provisionally? Why don't we, I'm going to go ahead and appoint the public defender. And then if you hire a private attorney, you can substitute, okay? Yes, sir. We'll come back for pre-trial, enter not guilty, come back on 12-28. This so that we can okay. Be if you hire an attorney, um, before I can see, or even I can see that's yeah. fine. You can hire whoever you'd like. Uh, if you do hire one, that's fine. Just have them give me a call. Okay. 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 All right. so this and this is yours as well. This shows you what you're charged with. Okay. We counsel yeah. approach real yes, quick.
Can the state please announce. Yes, Your Honor. This is Eric Schultz. He is here on 20 CF 2851. He is charged with possession of a controlled substance, more than 20 grams of cannabis, and violation of an injunction for protection against domestic violence. Hey, Mr. Schultz, you do have a right to have an attorney appointed with these new charges. Do you wish to have an attorney appointed? Um, if it helps me get out of jail. Can't make any promises on that. You want an attorney or not? All I'm going to do here today is, is this an arraignment? I'm going to accept a plea. I'm going to enter a not guilty plea on your behalf. That's what's going on today. But if you're not going to hire a private attorney, you need to consider accepting a public defender because you don't want to be in jail without an attorney. Nope. Says a Generally. Sorry. Public defender? Yes. Okay. You got it. Court, court will uh, appoint the public defender. Enter not guilty plea. We'll come back on 228, 1228, excuse me, December 28th at 9 a.m. on pretrial. Thank you, Your Honor. I'd like to hold him. He does have an offer from the state. I'm going to talk to you about that as soon as I can. We may be able to resolve it today if he's interested. Absolutely. Um, but I at least want to forward that to him um, if we can't get that resolved today. Thank you. So that's all your paperwork for right now. So they'll put you back there once I'm able to talk to you. I will. Thank you. Would counsel approach on that, on this? Twenty-two CF two five eight six. Mr. Simmons, uh, you do have a right to an attorney with this new charge. Do you wish to have an attorney appointed? Yes, Mr. Jones. Court will appoint the public defender. The court's going to enter a not guilty plea, as I mentioned to you, and we'll come back on twelve twenty-seven at nine a.m. for pretrial. Yes, sir. Hold on a second. Here. We know who's uh, getting appointed here. Yes, is that you? No, I would be your honor. I'm going to take care of it. Okay, here. Mr. Gibbs, he, I just wanted to make sure you got his contact information. Yep. That's who you're. I got yours. Is. Okay. Kenneth mm -hmm. Singletary. Twenty-two CF two four five six. Your Honor, oh. <coughs> Your Honor, this is Mr. Kenneth Singletary. We're here for a status conference in twenty-two CF two four five six. Tim Gibbs on his behalf. If we could approach briefly with the state. You may.
All right. Your Honor, uh, we're, we're going to go ahead and leave this set for December 28th for free trial. Very good. December 28th at 9 a.m. Kenneth. Kenneth. Ryan Smith. Your Honor, Tim Gibbs on behalf of Ryan Smith. He's uh, coming out of the holding area just, just now. Case number is 22 CF 1088. Tim Gibbs on his behalf. Your Honor, we have reached an agreement with the state to resolve this case today. Uh, he's got three counts, possession of controlled substance, possession of paraphernalia, and driving on a suspended license under the HGO scheme. On all three of those counts, Judge, he's going to withdraw any previously entered not guilty plea and enter a plea of no contest. He would be adjudicated guilty on all three counts. Be sentenced to 10 days in the Co Okaloosa County Jail, credit for time served concurrent between all three counts. Assess a $100 cost of prosecution, uh, standard court costs, which I believe are going to be $515 in this case, a $100 public defender fee that would be due in within, within 180 days of his release before it is reduced to judgment, so he has time to pay that or he can get a payment plan with the clerk. And then the state would take no action on um, any FTAs. He is actually being held on an FTA currently. The state would take no action on that. I believe that would set him up for release today. If I may approach with a score sheet and a written plan. No objection to the And that's the agreement, Your Honor. Very good. So, Mr. Smith, would you please raise your right hand, sir? Do you swear or affirm the information you're about to provide this court is the truth, not the mother truth, so help you God? Yes, sir. You heard your attorney state the terms of the plea agreement, and it's also contained in your written agreement, which you've signed. Yes, sir. That your agreement? Yes, sir. Certainly understand why you're entering into it. Yes, sir. We'll be getting out today, 10 days in the county jail. Um, all your accounts are concurrent, credit for time served, you got fees and costs, payable in 180 days. Is that all, gone yes, over all that with your attorney? Yes, sir. Got all your legal questions answered? Yes, sir. Understand this is the final resolution of this matter? Yes, sir. Very good. Based on that, the court will accept your plea uh, on all counts, and, and there'll be uh, an adjudication of guilt, 10 days in the county jail, they'll all be concurrent, so they're not stacked on top of one another. You will get credit for time served, plus the fees and costs. Going to pay in 180 days or goes to collections. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Much. Appreciate it. Good luck. Andrew Stokes. Andrew Stokes. Your Honor, I've just been, been been informed by probation that Mr. Stokes is currently incarcerated in the Oak or Escambia County Jail. Excuse me, Escambia County Jail. I'd ask to continue this case 22 CF 2658 for another uh, arraignment date, since we would still have to go through arraignment. And in the meantime, I may very well file a written plea of not guilty if I can contact him. What's our next arraignment date, ma'am, Madam Clerk? December 1st, and that'll be in the afternoon, 1.30. Thank you, Your Honor. At Tamika Tassin, <coughs> if I pronounce that right. Did I, I pronounce that right? Yes. Would the state announce, please? 22 CF 2628. Ms. Tassin, as I mentioned before, you do have a right to an attorney with these new charges? Do you wish to have an attorney appointed or are you going to hire private counsel? Um, appointed. I had hired a um, counsel before on this and he came to the jail when I was in jail to first appearance. So I don't know if that's a that different case. Is that same, a different case? The same, the same thing. So you are. Who, who's the attorney? <coughs> um, Mr. Burt. Mr. Burt? Burt Moore? I don't have him Mr. listed. I gave him the information while he was there. That she met with Burt Moore at the jail and... Here with another client, Your Honor, going to... I can talk to him later. I can talk. I'll talk to him later. Was that about your violation of probation, maybe? Yes, but when he came in with this, when, it, when, I, when this case came up and they took me from jail and for long, I gave him the information. I mean, maybe he just spoke with me about it, but... I, 
I know I hired him, but I don't know which case is up. Okay. She may be referring to a uh, judge. She's got a violation of probation case on the south end, so that may be what Mr. Moore was speaking with her about in a, as well as this case. Yeah, he kind of talked to me about both of them. I just got to figure out what we're doing here today. Okay. I mean, I'll appoint one. I'm going to talk to him about okay. it. So I'm going to go ahead and give you an appointment. Your Honor, here yes. I'm here, Your Honor. Sorry. <laughs> Is this your client here, Mr. Moore? Yes, sir. <laughs> Are you sure? That sounds like an un un unclear answer. Your Honor, I was present with her first appearance, so I am. Okay, she's so you're not listed as no, on sir. the court file. Well, that's all right. We'll, we'll do a notice of appearance today, Your Honor. And they asked for a one cycle continuance. How about a, a plea of not guilty? And a plea of not guilty, certainly. Right, we'll enter a plea of not guilty and we'll come back on 1227 for. And, Your Honor, we'll follow up with a written demand for discovery to the state. Very good. Thank you, Your Honor. And what Thank day, you. sir? 27. 1227. December yes. 27. I heard you say that, Judge. And if I show up, I think every lawyer will in the community will ask me to cover for them that day. This is 28. <laughs> I'm not commenting. <laughs> Thank you, Honor. I'll be back in a minute, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. Joshua Todd. Eight, please. Judge, this is 22 CF 2650. Hello, oh, Mr. Todd. Same thing you heard me say, you do have a right to an attorney. In this matter, you wish me to appoint you an attorney? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So the court will appoint the public defender, enter a not guilty plea in your behalf. We'll come back on 1227 for pretrial in the interim. Just meet up with your attorney, okay? Yes, Your Honor. Get the contact information right behind you. And Judge, I do anticipate today an information being filed with only misdemeanors, so this will be transferred to misdemeanor court. And um, I guess they'll notify you accordingly. Okay. So just kind of be aware of that. It might, it might be a different court, or probably will be a different court now, because different judge handles misdemeanors than felons. Yes, okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Heather Weber. 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 Oh, judge, that was North Frost, uh, November 7th. Yeah, because I don't know who. Okay. Any other ones we passed over on the arraignment? Ms. Etheridge, Tyan, Colbert? Yes, sure, we're ready. Okay. Yeah, he's in Good. custody, Ron. Is he on the room? He's in handle. I'm just trying to. What's the case number? Um, 22 CF 2771. Casey Etheridge from Mr. Colbert, and we're here in 22 CF 2771. Mr. Colbert would like to enter a no contest plea and accept the state's offer. And it would be for a lesser included offense of carrying a concealed weapon. Uh, Florida statute 790.06. Hold, Hold on. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, so it'd be a lesser included offense of carrying a concealed weapon, a first degree misdemeanor. Do you need a statutory site? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's 790.06. Okay. And it'd be for adjudication of guilt, 15 days in county jail with credit for all time served, $270 in court costs, $100 cost of prosecution, $150 in public defender fees, um, and um, he has to forfeit the weapon that was um, taken in, and then 180 days to pay or reduce to judgment. May I approach? That is state's offer, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Colbert, would you please raise your right hand, sir? Do you swear or affirm the information you're about to provide this court is the truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Okay, Mr. Colbert, I, you heard your attorney state the terms of your plea agreement, and I see that same terms are contained in your written plea agreement. Is that your understanding of what the plea agreement is, and are you in agreement with it? Yes, sir. Okay, and you've gone over this plea and sentencing agreement. It's got a lot of other stuff in it. 
You had all your legal questions answered about this plea. Yes, sir. Okay. There are some valuable legal rights. The reason I'm asking you that is that you're giving up some valuable legal rights by entering into this plea. What do I mean by that? Right to go to a trial, the right to confront witnesses, certain rights to appeal, all those things. Just want to make sure you understand the ins and outs of all that stuff so you make an informed decision about this plea. Yes, sir. Okay? So you've gone over, had all your questions answered by your attorney? Yes, sir. And you believe it's in your best interest to enter into this? Yes, sir. You understand that this will be a final resolution of your case? Yes, sir. Okay. Based upon that testimony, the court will accept your plea, and uh, the court will, uh, there will be uh, an adjudication of guilt on the lesser included offense of carrying a concealed weapon. Uh, you'll get 15 days in the county jail. You'll get credit for all time served. There'll be fees and costs that are contained in the plea agreement. You get 180 days to pay after you get out of jail, or it'll go to a judgment. Sir. Okay. Any questions? No, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So, that's all on my arraignment document. Your Honor, I would like to recall Mr. Schultz. I believe we have a resolution. Okay. Schultz. Oh, that's also we good men. Uh, Ms. Fly, can somebody call Ms. Flowers? We also have Zachary Moore, that's Mr. Williams' case. Okay. He's, he's still talking with me. Schultz. Did you need the offer from that? No. Okay. Tim Gibbs on Mr. behalf of Mr. Schultz, 20 CF 2851, if I can have just one moment. Mr. Schultz has just signed a written plea agreement in this case. The terms of that plea are as follows. On count one, possession of marijuana over 20 grams, he would receive a withhold of adjudication, be placed on 24 months of probation, during which time he would need to pay a $100 cost of prosecution, $515 in court costs, $150 public defender fee, undergo a substance abuse evaluation with any follow-up treatment as recommended, a batterer's intervention program, no drugs or alcohol without a valid prescription. On count two, the violation of a domestic violence injunction would be 12 months probation concurrent for a total of 24 months probation. The batter's intervention program that's required by that count would may be completed uh, while he is on the total 24 months of probation so that he ends up not violated for that non-completion. If I may approach with a written, and that would be an adjudication of guilt on this, ch on count two. If I may approach with a written plea and score sheet. No objection to the score sheet. Thank you. State in agreement? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Schultz, would you raise your right hand, sir? Do you swear or affirm the information you're about to provide this court is the truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, sir. You heard your attorney state the terms of the plea agreement? I did. And that those same terms are contained in your written plea agreement that I see here and you've signed? Yes, sir. You've gone over this plea agreement in detail with your attorney, make sure you understand all the legal ramifications of it? I did. And Importantly, you're waiving some valuable legal rights. You explained those. You had a chance to have all your questions answered. Yes, sir. You understand this will be a final resolution of your case. Yes, sir. And importantly, this this uh, this matter will uh, resolve these cases completely, and it'll be a final resolution. Do you understand that? I do. 
Any further questions regarding this? I do not. Okay. Based upon that, you okay with the score sheet? Yes, sir. Based upon this testimony, the court will accept your plea. No contest. There'll be a withhold of adjudication on the possession charge and adjudication of guilt on the violation uh, of the domestic violence injunction. Uh, just to count one, 24 months probation, certain court costs and fees, the batter's intervention program, and the uh, substance abuse evaluation are included as a part of this. The violation as well, the 12 months probation, BIP may be completed during the probation for count one. Actually, the BIP should be in count two. You've got it listed in count one. I do have it listed in count one. If the court wants me to fix that, I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Go ahead and just do that. But it says the same thing. It, you've got 24 months to complete the BIP, but... Yes, sir. I understand. Better to get at it sooner than later. Absolutely. I can okay. that any off. questions concerning any of this? I do not. Thank you, sir. Good luck. You'll, just, you'll probably have to get finger and meet with probation. Okay. <coughs> Your Honor, I did breach Miss Flowers. She indicated that she was here this morning and she did forget to ask that his uh, BOPs track with his new law, which would be for uh, 1228. Okay, let me see here. Ernest Goodman. What number is that? So, Mr. Williams, yes, sir. Uh, Jamari McCray. Jamari McCray, yes, sir. Uh, he's, uh, if I call correctly, I think he's in jail. And also, Zachary Moore. Zachary Moore was a case that we passed. <coughs> uh, they were wanting to go ahead and do his DNA. The court wanted me to talk with him. Um, they hit me with a uh, an offer uh, to resolve the case. Um, so I just got through speaking with him. I'm going to draft that up for him at his request, and we'll have to get him back in front of the court. Uh, Judge, Mr. McRae stands before the court. Um, I'm going to enter a plea of not guilty on his behalf, request uh, trial by jury in 15 days to file any pre-arraignment motions. You can make an appointment come in and see me, okay, um, so I can go over the charges with you and stuff. Very good. And are not guilty. We'll come back on 1227. Thank you, Judge. All right, sir. If you'll give me just a few minutes, I'll have that offer done up for you. I have Mr. Goodman is number eight on the felony plea docket. Went through that three times and couldn't find it. Thank you. 
So we were tracking that with her other case? Is that what? He, he had, yes, Your Honor. He has two VOPs, and then he has this new law. And, I, and so she's asking that they all run together and be placed on the 1228 docket. She said okay, she's so already. So we're entering not guilty. Yes. Is he here? I told him that information. You told him that? You'd like to tell him. No, you're, you're good. Just want to make sure that he knows. Yes, sir. Okay, so I think that does it except for. Mr. Williams, one case which we can, That's correct, we can pick up a little bit later. Okay. So what I'd like to do, we have a few. I know we have some very um, not only serious but uh, involved sentencing hearings that are going on this afternoon. Um, but we also have a couple of pleas in this not in the second part of our docket. So why don't we get the pleas? I think there's three or maybe a couple, two or three. We'll get those done. We'll take a short break, and then we'll come back. We've got three sentencings. We will finish those today. I know we're okay. Uh, well, that's just for me to come to. She doesn't need to come. Back. Running a little late. So let's begin. Uh, you want to try and do Hector Martinez? Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Come forward. Just going to take a few. Already keep you waiting. Oh, yes, please. Please. Yes, sir, right here. Your Honor, may I approach? You may. Thank you. Tim Clarity appearing on behalf of Hector Martinez. The case number is 2021 CF 2017. Judge, this case had previously been scheduled for a contested sentencing hearing, and the understanding at the time was that the minimum guideline sentence was 23.7 months and that Mr. Martinez would face up to the statutory maximum of 10 years in the Department of Corrections. As we prepared for that sentencing, we came to the conclusion that we did not have a good faith basis to argue for a downward departure before the court. Therefore, the the risk of attending a sentencing without a downward departure that he would receive more than the 23.7 minimum guideline sentence really formed the basis for us giving him the advice to go ahead and enter the plea for the minimum guideline sentence, which Ms. Bossell graciously agreed to allow us to do. So that's what Mr. Martinez is prepared to do today. In preparation for today's hearing, we had two meetings in our office with Mr. Martinez and his family, followed up with a phone call as well. We've gone over the plea agreement. We've also provided him a written copy of the plea agreement to make sure that he understood both the risks, uh, what he was giving up by entering into a negotiated plea versus a contested hearing before the court. And Mr. Martinez has indicated that he does wish to move forward. So with that understanding, Judge, I'll go ahead and read the terms of the plea agreement. If you would be so kind. Thank you. On counts one and two, both are a third degree felony with a maximum of five years in the Department of Corrections. He would be sentenced to the minimum guideline sentence of 23.7 months in the Department of Corrections to run concurrent between counts one and two. He'll be required to serve eight years on sex offender probation, a $50 cost of supervision followed by 515 in court cost and a $151 surcharge. He'll be ordered not to have any electronic devices capable of internet access. He does understand that he'll be designated a sexual offender, which will include all the statutory requirements. He is able to have unsupervised contact with his own children, no contact with any minors until after a risk assessment has been done. And even after that point, he'll be ordered to not have any unsupervised contact with minors. He'll be required to wear a GPS monitor pursuant to the Jessica Lunsford Act at the reduced rate of $1 per day and credit for any time served, and he is adjudicated guilty. I did attach a score sheet to the plea. I have reviewed that, and we are in agreement that the minimum sentence is the 23.7 months. Thank you very much, counsel. The only, uh, not clarification, just to make sure I understand it. What precisely does the, or maybe everyone's clear about it except me, what is the risk assessment that you're referring to in the plea agreement? I just want to make sure He's clear about what he has to do before he can have contact. What, what does that mean, risk assessment? 
Your Honor, generally, if an individual is uh, placed on supervision for a sexual offense, then probation and parole will order the risk assessment to be done. That risk assessment will then make a it technical term risk assessment. It, I believe that's actually how it's listed in the probation order. Okay. And then that would make a determination. Well, everybody understands what it is. I want to make sure he's clear about it. That's all. I, that's all I care. Yes, Your Honor. It just seemed to be not a. Wasn't exactly clear, Mr. Barry. Did you? For the most part, they do an evaluation. They are put through treatment, and then upon them completing it, you're saying that they he can have <coughs> contact with minors, but no, <coughs> but it, no unsupervised contact. That's correct. Is that the wording. That I heard? With the exception of his own children, we're not objecting to unsupervised contact with his own children once that's done. Okay. Once that's completed, are you saying he can have contact with his own children now? Yes, sir. Okay. That was our intent originally. We have no concerns on that front. That's the way I read this as well. Yes, sir. And that is the state's agreement, Your Honor, and as was Mr. Flaherty said, within the guidelines. Mr. Martinez, would you please raise your right hand, sir? Do you swear or affirm that the information you're about to provide this court is the truth, not the <coughs> truth, so help you God? Yes, Your Honor. So uh, you heard your attorney uh, give a very good and thorough explanation of the process of the plea agreement. I do note that uh, as he was reading the terms of the plea agreement, they are as contained in the written agreement. And as he said to the court, and I'm going to ask you, have you gone over this in detail with him? Make yes, sure sir. you understand all the legal ramifications of this plea agreement. Yes, sir. Importantly, you're waiving some valuable legal rights, right to a trial, contest witnesses, etc. You believe it's in your best interest to enter into this? Yes, sir. Did anybody threaten or coerce you to get you to enter into this plea? No, sir. Did you do so knowingly and willingly? Yes, sir. It is in my best interest. And do you have any further questions of your attorney regarding the legalities of this plea agreement? No, Your Honor. Very good. Based upon that testimony, the court will accept the plea agreement, and the court will sentence you as to counts 1 and 2 to 23.7 months in the Department of Corrections. This will be concurrent, so both of these will be 23.7 months, but they'll be concurrent and not stacked on top of one another. Followed by a year sex offender probation, all the fees and costs, um, the other requirements. Importantly, no electronic devices uh, capable of Internet access, designation and statutory requirements. Then importantly, you may have unsupervised contact with your own children. Uh, you must wear a GPS monitor uh, pursuant to the Jessica Lungsford Act. No contact with minors until after a risk assessment, and even then, um, no unsupervised contact thereafter. Okay. Any <coughs> questions? No, sir. Anything, Mr. Flaherty? No, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, due to the fact that GPS is going to have to pay that fee, we will request the supervision fees be waived. No order. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I have, Judge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Moore. Okay. Is it Leonard Ellis here? Yes, Your Honor. He is before the court on 20 CF 3257. This would be a uh, violation of probation. It looks like he had originally pled to a misdemeanor. Correct. So, Mr. Ellis, um, this basically is your first hearing on the violation of probation. So, it's, it's uh, similar to the arraignment which we were going through before where you have to make a plea. You don't have an attorney appointed at this time, but you do have the right to an attorney. You wish to have an attorney appointed? Yes, sir. Okay. So the court's going to appoint the public defender, and the court's going to enter a denial. We don't call them not guilty plea in violations of probation. They're called denials. So I'm going to enter a denial, and then we'll come back on uh, 
What's our next miscellaneous that maybe December 8th? We we'll come back. 29th, Your Honor, in case we need more time. What's that? We're going to need more time probably to get a file and everything, Your Honor. Could we do the 29th, if you don't mind? Okay. Well, it's, it's generally tracking on the VOP docket rather than the well, Right, right. The 29th, I believe, is a criminal motions docket. Oh, that's too. a motions. Uh, that's yeah, a it is. miscellaneous. Okay. miscellaneous docket, too. Right. I was thinking pretrial, and you're right. So we'll come back on 1229 in the morning at 9 a.m. And in the meantime, meet up with your attorney so she can go over your different options. Okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we handled Daniel Witted this morning, right? That's correct, John. Okay. Okay. So we've got Mr. Moore's case. Yes, sir, Your Honor. I'm going to get my client on the other side. Please, I'll just be one minute. Okay, well, I'm going to take a break. We'll catch you right on the front end of the break, and then we'll go right into the sentences, and we'll... Uh, We'll be back in All about rise. Time. Rise.
Ja, ja. Obviously, done something out there. Please be seated. Mr. Williams, what you got? No. Judge, I've got Zachary Moore uh, supported past the case. I supported past the case for a few minutes and been talk with him. I did note um, uh, on my folder already, so I can read the uh, proposed sent sent to the record. And Please do. Do we? Let's see. Make sure. Let's. I'll get him on the record, Judge. Twenty-two CF two one one three. Go ahead. All right. Thank you, Judge. Uh, I've spoken with Mr. Moore, and the state has tendered an offer that he's decided to accept on count one, which is fleeing and attempting to elude uh, a third-degree felony. He would be adjudicated guilty, be placed on two years community control. Uh, he'd pay $448 in court costs, $100 cost of prosecution. Um, there's a $100 public defender fee and then a $50 public defender application fee. He would uh, suffer uh, a one-year driver's license suspension and do 100 hours community service work. Uh, the state indicated they had no objection to a business purpose license if he otherwise qualifies. On count two, which is a first offense, second degree misdemeanor, driving on license suspended, he would be adjudicated guilty and sentenced to time served. That's the agreement, Judge. You're in Agreement as to the score sheet, Mr. Williams. Yes, sir. I went over the score sheet with him. He scores a total of 4.4 uh, total sentence points. Uh, he's in agreement with that. Mr. Moore, would you please raise your right hand, sir? Do you swear or affirm the information you're about to provide this court is the truth, nothing but the truth, so I hope you got it. Yes, sir. You heard your attorney state the terms of the plea agreement. Yes, sir. You put your hand out. Is that... Uh, and I see that that same plea agreement is, is in the written plea agreement, which you uh, appears that you've signed. Have you gone over this plea agreement in detail with your attorney to make sure you understand what this is all about and have all your legal questions answered? Yes, sir. Importantly, by entering this plea agreement, you're, a couple of important legal things are happening. One, this is the final adjudication of this case and you're waiving the right to go to a trial. You're giving that up. No trial, can't confront witnesses, etc. Do you believe that's in your best interest to do that? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, are you entering into this plea freely and voluntarily? Yes, sir. And you've had all your legal questions answered by your attorney? Yes, sir. Okay. Very good. Based upon that, the court will accept your, your plea agreement. And on the fleeing and attempting to elude charge, uh, there'll be an adjudication of guilt. You have two years of community control. Now, community control is basically, it's not basically, it's house arrest. A lot of supervision. You're willing to do that. That's a condition of your probation. You violate it, you end up back here looking at time. Yes, sir. You clear about that? Yes, You're sir. You're committed to do follow the rules on this? Yes, sir. Okay. Stay in good contact with your probation officer that's critical as to the other uh, there's also fees and costs that are contained in here and then the driving on a suspended also an adjudication of guilt you'll get credit for time served um, and there is a driver's license suspension right no objection to a special business purpose driver's license okay anything else Yes sir. Uh, yes, sir. The state just brought to my attention. I don't have it reflected on my file, but theirs uh, shows that there was a previous failure to appear. Um, part of the agreement is, is that there will be no action taken on the failure to appear. Just make a note of that in here, just so the client makes sure he gets that benefit. State's in agreement on that. Yes, sir. We request a supervision phase So. <coughs> Thank you. Other than that, 
that, we don't have anything further uh, with this gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Williams. All right, sir, they're going to direct Mr. you over more. With a T R E R, case number twenty two C F six six zero. We have a plea. Okay. Would you like for me to announce terms or approach? Please. Which one first? You you may approach, but you need to if you need them to state I, the I terms. Down, <laughs> okay. And Mr. Moore, have you attached the score sheet, sir? Yes, and you attached the score sheet. Attached. Okay. Thank you. And your honor, the score sheet does adjust uh, does reflect the adjusted charges. Does reflect what? The adjusted charge. The lesser included that we'll be planning. Your Honor, she's going to plead to a lesser included of felony child abuse with the understanding that she would serve four years of probation with the Department of Corrections. She would have no contact with the victim who's judged because she's a minor, JS or initials, except for medical or as a therapist recommends. Your Honor, I want to approach and discuss that with the court when we're through announcing the rest of the terms, if I may. No contact with the co-defendant, uh, Brian Williams, standard fines and cost. And may we approach, Your Honor? You may.
to count one, there will be a lesser included charge of child abuse and violation of 827.03, a third degree felony. And then as to count two and three, the state will announce the null process. Okay. Very good. And Judge, Judge, I did say adjudication was withheld. I hope. That is the state's agreement. That is correct. So, uh, Ms. Ayer, uh, you heard your attorney state the terms of the plea agreement. I, I'm going to restate it to make sure that you understand, make sure I understand what's down here, and more importantly, what you do. Obviously, the core of this is the four years of, of probation with the, uh, with the Department of, um, is it with the Department of Corrections? Is that who the Department? It, it, it's with probation. With probation. Okay, oh. whatever. It's not with the Department of Corrections. Okay. So, importantly, there's no contact with the co-defendant, Brian Williams, and there's no contact with the, with the child, the victim. And we understand that there are some medical issues, potentially where she would be calling you, and maybe in an emergency. If she does, you're not in violation. We're going to try and clarify. That's what we were talking about here. We're going to try and clarify the language so that you know. You can't reach out to her, but if she's calling in an emergency and you, you know, you worry that something might be happening to her or something, or she might be in crisis, you can pick up. Okay, so we're going to try and make that clear. Um, but other than that, you know, you can basically can't reach out to her to have contact. And when they do, you need to, you know, contact the appropriate authorities. And your honor, also, if there's the therapist recommendation, right. right? If there's the therapist recommendation, then that's another uh, out that you can make contact. Okay. Okay. So. You understand that by entering this, you're waiving the rights to go to a trial. This is the final adjudication of this case. You believe yes. it's in your best interest to do this? Your Honor, did you swear her? I'm sorry, I may Did I? I don't think so. I don't think I did. Oh, I'm sorry, actually. Judge. Why are you, why you apologizing? You're doing me a favor. <laughs> you swear or affirm the information you're about to provide this court is the truth, nothing but the truth, so I hope you got it. Okay, everything you just told me you're verifying is truthful. Okay. So, uh, you went over all this with your attorney, made sure you had all your legal questions answered on this, and you yes, understand this is a final adjudication. It's a resolution of your case. Yes. Nobody threatened to coerce you to get you to enter into this plea? Free and voluntary? Yes. Okay. Based upon that testimony, the court will accept your plea to the lesser included charges that were announced by the state, and so there will be a you're pleading to one count of child abuse. There'll be a withhold of adjudication, four years of probation, and then the other contact and fines and costs that are contained in the uh, in the fee, in the uh, uh, plea and sentencing agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Is she, uh, no fingerprints, correct? I don't know. No fingerprints. Thank you. Okay. You need to go over there. Thank you. <laughs> All I have, Your Honor. You may be excused, sir. The arraignment docket has now shown up. Okay. Who would that be? Heather Kelly. Heather Kelly. 22 CF 2504. Sorry, well, you get I the have times, times mixed up on that. Um, no, sir. I was just running late. Um, well, ma'am, you're sorry. You, you know what a capius is? That means the guys in the green shirts were out pick you up. You spend the night in jail. That's where you were headed, ma'am. This you need to take this seriously. You've been charged with a felony. So, would you go ahead and announce the case? Yes, Your Honor. And I, I did say that wrong. It's uh, twenty-five. Sorry, 22 CF 2604. She is charged with felony petty theft, resisting a retail merchant, and trespass. Ma'am, you do have a right to have an attorney appointed in these matters. Do you wish to have an attorney appointed? Uh, yes, sir. Or will appoint the public defender. I'm going to enter a not guilty plea on your behalf mm -hmm. so you have a chance to meet with your attorney. Come back on 12:27 at 9 a.m. Got right. that? 9 yes, a.m. I'll be here. Okay. Thank you. Ma'am, hang on just one second. Talk to your attorney in the interim. Okay. I'm gonna give you some information, some paperwork to fill out. We need to fill that out today. 
Judge, if I can, um, on Mr. Moore, it's on the written plea agreement and the state's agreed to it, but I don't know that I announced it. Um, that is uh, running concurrently with any sentence he's now serving. Um, that was the, the gentleman that we brought up that pled him to community control. Uh, it's written on the plea agreement. I just want to stick it on the record before we, we got off the record. If it's on the plea agreement, then that would suffice. He's on, pro he's on in community control and probation over in Santa Rosa County. We would run it concur anyway. Okay. Fine. Are you doing that? Done. I'm sorry. Come outside with me. Okay. Very good. Ronaldo Torres Brito. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Clayton Cash for Mr. Torres Brito. He is present uh, in the courtroom, standing with me at the lectern. Okay. We're here on. Uh, Sentencing based upon a plea to the court. That is correct, Your Honor. Does the state wish to begin? Your Honor, uh, generally we have no witnesses or evidence to put on. We do have our sentencing letter that we provided, we and we would defer to we, we would defer to Mr. Couch um, as a defendant uh, who is asking, and we believe for a downward departure to counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> First, uh, may I invite the uh, family of Mr. Uh, Torres Brito just to stand up and be recognized by the court. They're not going to make a statement. Thank you. Your Honor, we did provide a letter to the court uh, arguing for a downward departure based on four uh, different conditions. Um, but before I address those, uh, Mr. Torres Brito had a statement he wanted to read to the court. Very good, sir. You may. Go ahead. <clears throat> Hello, Your Honor. I would like to start by saying that I regret everything that has happened. I would also like to apologize to the victim and their family. I've put them through a horrible experience that no one should go through. I also ask for forgiveness from my family and friends who have suffered a lot and have shown me nothing but their love and support through this process. I thank them all for their help. I know I can be a better person, so I can make sure this never happens again. I've reached out for help with therapy, but I would like to get additional help so I can become a better human being. I take responsibility for the mistake I have made and learn from it. I ask you, Your Honor, to give me the chance to get help I need to make up for my mistakes and to show you that I can get better. If you could allow me to return home with my family, I will take advantage of that opportunity to get the help I need, go to college and work towards being a contributing member of society. I would also like to work closely with the court to make up for my mistakes. And once again, I would like to apologize to the victim and their family for putting them through all of this. I hope they will recover from the trauma I have caused them. I will respectfully accept your decision, Your Honor. Thank you. Your Honor, uh, the four uh, grounds that we are suggesting to the court uh, would be a basis for a downward departure. One of them. Uh, was a psychological evaluation that was conducted of Mr. Uh, Torres Brito in June of this year. However, the copy that I attached to the letter was difficult uh, to read. I have the original that was sent to me, uh, if the court uh, would like to see that. Sure. Approach. Yeah, I thought so, yeah. I was just checking to see if the same one. Hold on a second. Thank you. Yes, sir. You know, Mr. Torres Bruno has uh, remained competent. I had no uh, concerns about that throughout the uh, process of defending him in this case. However, it did become readily apparent that he uh, has a uh, mental illness that may have influenced his ability to make good decisions, especially the ones that he made in this case. So um, we are arguing that his ability to appreciate the criminal nature 
uh, of the conduct was impaired. Uh, not, it's not a McNaughton rule type of situation, but it did uh, affect his ability, and we suggest that uh, that is a mitigating factor that the court can con uh, consider. Your Honor, uh, I don't know if the court has had an opportunity to review the uh, incident report or offense report in this case, but um, our argument I that have. the... I beg your pardon? I have. Okay, sir. The argument that I had that the victim was an initiator, willing participant, aggressor, or provoker of the incident, we certainly don't think he was the initiator, uh, but he was a uh, willing participant. And the text messages that were recovered from the victim's phone, starting on page 9 of the incident report, suggest that he was... Um, although not legally able to consent to this, he certainly uh, factually consented. And uh, there was never any suggestion that he was being threatened or pressured or um, uh, otherwise co coerced into doing this. So we would ask that the court consider that as a mitigating factor. Although there are a number of counts in this case and that there are um, uh, this activity uh, went over about three a months period. They're all part of a single scheme, a single series of events, and we suggest that this is an isolated incident. This series of events was isolated. There's been no suggestion that he has ever done anything like this before or since, and there are no other identified victims in this case. Finally, Your Honor, uh, the defendant requires uh, specialized treatment for a mental disorder. The letter that I just presented to the court that was always also included in the uh, letter to the court uh, identifies three medications that he's taking and the requirement of his continued therapy. Um, we would suggest to the court that that is also a mitigating uh, factor in this case. Your Honor, uh, if the court finds that these four grounds are uh, sufficient, then certainly the court needs to determine whether it's appropriate in this case, and we would suggest that it is. Uh, Mr. Uh, Torres Brito has been uh, very remorseful, as demonstrated by his statement to the court today, uh, that he is uh, willing to undergo any kind of treatment, therapy, um, or other specialized conditions. We think that uh, in this case, that imprisonment is not uh, necessary in this case, and would suggest to the court that an uh, intensive period of uh, probation uh, or uh, supervision would be appropriate. And uh, Mr. Torres Brito is prepared to move to Florida uh, so that he would be supervised by uh, the Department of Corrections in Florida, possibly in Okaloosa County, so that the court would have uh, ready access to him should there be any suggestion of a violation. And Your Honor, that is my argument. Your Honor, as the court is aware, the state has a vastly different recommendation for this court. Mr. Torres Burrito is charged with three counts of possessing photos and images con containing sexual conduct with the child with intent to distribute second degree felonies. He's charged with possessing photos and motion pictures which include sexual conduct of a child, eight counts, which I would point out to the court also he assisted in creating. He is also charged with unlawful use of a two-way device, one count, and promoting sexual performance of a, count, of a child, six counts. To hold him accountable for this, Your Honor, we're asking for the 20 years of the Department of Corrections, followed by 10 years sex offender probation. He is required by law to be designated as a sexual offender based on these charges. If the court does place him on any type of supervision, the supervision would have to include a GPS monitor based on the age of the victim under the Jessica Lunsford Act. We're also asking, of course, that he comply with sex offender treatment, provide DNA, and have no contact with the victim or their family, and no unsupervised contact of any kind with any minors, not have any devices capable of internet access, and, or access to social media, forfeiture of his devices, the 867 in court costs. His score sheet does reflect a total of 189 points, which provides for a minimum of 120.5 months DOC. That's a minimum of 10 years, Your Honor which is deemed been appropriate by the legislature for these types of crimes, up to a maximum allowable of 150 years. It's the state's position, Your Honor, that this is not a minimum guideline case, based on the totality of the circumstances. The defendant in this case created a victim. He created a 14-year-old victim that now has to live with this for the rest of his life. He created child pornography. 
by directing this child to engage in sexual acts. It's contained in the police report. I'm not going to go into all the details, Your Honor, how he specifically directed this child to engage in sexual acts and film them or present them live to him as they were talking. We have viewed those acts. They are sexually explicit and they are creating a victim in this case. He took advantage of a, a vulnerable child. This child was already by the nature of his, of his sexual interests isolated somewhat in the community. He was seeking attention and acceptance. Mr. Torres Burrito preyed on that, Your Honor. This child engaged in chats with him when he saw he was going to get the attention that he sought. So yes, he did engage in these sexual acts without being forced to, but it's the state's position that he was groomed by the defendant and then participated in these acts. In speaking with the victim's father when this case first came up, the extent to which this victim was affected was such that we were contemplating how could we go forward with this case without asking this child to participate in depositions or at trial. He was that fragile. But then he did participate in counseling and got to the point where his father said, yes, if he needs to be talked to so this case can go forward, we will make that happen. And that is, in fact, what happened. He did provide his deposition on that. But the mental and emotional strain on this child and this family is also discussed by the father in the PSI. He provided an input there, and that it clarified to the court how this has affected the family. And this will stay with this victim for his entire life. He is currently undergoing treatment, and we anticipate that he will need to follow through with that for the rest of his life. So it has affected him. He did create a victim in this case, and we're asking the court to hold him accountable for that. As far as a legal basis for a downward departure, as of course this court knows, it's the state's position that there is no legal basis, and if there is, that it would be inappropriate to do so based on the totality of the circumstances that I just discussed. First of all, Your Honor, there were over 1,500 text messages between these two. Text messages, also audio and video chats. There were also calls that were done uh, and live action between the two of a sexual nature online. This went on for over two and a half months. It certainly affected the victim. and It was certainly not isolated. I'd like to address the, the basis that um, Mr. Couch brought up for the court. Uh, I'll just follow the order that he did for clarity. Uh, as far as appreciating the criminal nature of, of his conduct, first of all, there is no evidence before this court, no credit, credible, competent evidence that Mr. Torres Burrito could not understand what he was doing or appreciate the nature of his conduct. The uh, report that Mr. Couch refers to was conducted in 2014 when he was in high school. It talks about uh, reading comprehension and math <coughs> learning disabilities. It doesn't say that he cannot understand right from wrong. It's the state's position that Mr. Torres Burrito certainly had the maturity to understand right from wrong and certainly had the ability to realize that engaging these type of acts with a 14-year-old would be inappropriate. So we do not believe that that particular ground was met. As far as the victim being the initiator or a willing participant in this case, I've already discussed how the defendant preyed on him. And as the court said in State v. Rife at uh, 789 Southern 2nd 288, the court addresses the issue of the victim's willingness as a factor that might support a downward departure. And it states it's indeed a rare case involving a youthful victim of a sexual crime that su would support a downward departure sentence. Consent means intelligent, knowing, and voluntary consent and does not include coerced submission. But in determining whether this mitigator applies, the facts and circumstances of the relationship between the victim and the defendant should be considered, and also the age and maturity of the victim. In this case, Your Honor, it's the state's position that the defendant did prey on him. He didn't force him, but he took advantage of a vulnerability of this victim. So as far as the victim being a willing participant, we do not believe that is met under that particular condition. As far as an unsophisticated manner of being isolated for which he has shown remorse, we'll leave it to the court to determine whether or not it feels that Mr. Torres Brito showed the appropriate remorse for his actual actions. 
But, Your Honor, as far as it being isolated or unsophisticated, uh, as the court addresses in State v. Davis and State v. Furman found uh, respectively at 141 Southern 3rd, 1230 for Davis, and 161 Southern 3rd, 403, the court should look at the separate and deliberate steps that were taken in this case in determining whether or not it was unsophisticated. In this case, Mr. Torres Burrito had to reach out on numerous occasions, like I said, there were over 1,500 text messages, and speak to the defendant or to the victim to ask him to engage in audio and video chats. Um, certainly, he took separate and deliberate steps to make these things happen. So we don't think that he, that is unsophisticated in that. Additionally, he had plenty of time to appreciate the nature and consequences of his actions and walk away. And that also is discussed in both Davis and Furman. So we do not believe that he has shown that it was isolated or unsophisticated. And as the court is aware, all three, isolated, unsophisticated, and shown remorse, must be shown for this to be a valid basis for a downward. As far as specialized treatment for a mental disorder, I will again refer to the fact that there's really no evidence, competent, credible evidence, that Mr. Torres Brito requires specialized treatment for a mental health disorder. Um, in the information that was provided by Mr. Couch, I believe it's the one-page document in the mental health evaluation that was done more recently than the 2014, it discusses the fact that he has a major depressive disorder. I would point out to the court that that evaluation, I believe, was done after a suicide attempt when these charges were pending. So it has nothing to do with what happened at the time and whether or not it affected him at the time. Um, additionally, Your Honor, there has to be under this ground a substantial belief that his actions will change in the future, that the specialized treatment first has to be shown as being necessary. We don't believe that has been shown by any competent, credible evidence. And also, he has to show that he's amenable to treatment. And amenable in this case is that he must, there must be a belief that his, treat, his behavior will change based on the treatment that's being suggested. There is really no treatment plan other than he needs some medication and counseling. So we don't believe that's either been met either, Your Honor. <coughs> Finally, even if the court does believe that there is a legal basis for a downward departure, we do ask the court not to lose sight of how this has affected the victim, how it will affect him the rest of the life. It's created a victim of child pornography. There's, there's additional videos out there now. It will remain with him the rest of his life. He took advantage of a child. And in order to protect society from any further concerns, we believe we do need to limit Mr. Torres Burrito's access to children. We believe nothing short of incarceration is appropriate. And we certainly do not believe that it's a minimum guideline sentence, as I've already discussed. Thank you. Governor, may I address the uh, argument? Uh, although we were initially told that uh, the victim was not, would not be available for deposition, and that did change, I think, if I heard Ms. Basso correctly, uh, we never took uh, the child's uh, deposition. We scheduled it, but we never took it. Um, and that was at the direction of my client, not wanting to further put um, uh, my client, or my client not wanting to further put any trauma on the uh, family or the uh, victim. Uh, and I would also suggest to the court that the uh, minimum guideline sentence contemplates the charges and the uh, nature of these charges and I have heard nothing to suggest that uh, there is any uh, aggravating factors that are not already addressed in the charges. So we would ask the court uh, to downwardly depart, but if it is not inclined to do so, to sentence them to not more than... Do you need aggravating Make factors to, to go above the guidelines? Well, I would say, suggest to the court that the legislature has uh, addressed uh, that's this. A, that's a legal question. You yes, can sir. answer it in a legal manner. Yes or no? I, I, mean, I don't know. You may not know it. I don't believe it is, but I just it, you're raising something. I just want to understand what I need to do. Miss Bossow knows. So well, she's certainly uh, well, Your Honor. Will opine. All right. I'm not sure I heard the whole question, but if I understand you correctly, you want me to rephrase it? You want me to re-say it? Please do. You stated that 
the minimum guidelines, in order to go above the minimum guidelines, it requires some additional factors, aggravating factors. That's what I thought you said, and so I'm asking you about it. Is that required? No, no, not at all, Your Honor. I, I believe the court has a discretion of uh, sentencing to above the guidelines. What I'm suggesting to the court is that that discretion is misplaced in this case because uh, it, everything that is contemplated in these charges were addressed by the sentencing guidelines. Certainly the court has a discretion. It doesn't need to have anything other than its opinion of the facts and the circumstances. But I would just suggest to the court and argue to the court that the 120 uh, months uh, prison sentence is uh, certainly sufficient to address the, the facts of this case. And Your Honor, I do thank Mr. Couch for pointing out to me um, we did take the deposition of the victim's father. I thought we had taken the victim's, but he's absolutely correct, so I don't want to mislead the court on that. Um, but we had discussed doing it, and then at the last minute, it was backed off from. But as far as uh, going above the minimum or above the guideline sentence, Your Honor, we believe that there is a request to go more than 25% above the guideline sentence, and the court must find there was an aggravating factor. But we do believe, Your Honor, in this case that there are aggravating factors that apply under 921-0016. Specifically, the court can look under subsection 2, J, that the victim was especially vulnerable due to age or physical or mental disability, and we do believe that due to his age, that does apply. And also under subsection uh, Q, it says that the defendant induced a minor to participate in any of the offenses pending before the court at disposition, and we do believe that applies as well. So if the court does believe it has to find ag aggravating factors, we do believe that they are present in this case. It seems to be a circular argument to say that these are aggravating factors when the nature of the charge itself involves a uh, child. Uh, so I, again, I come back to, I think that the charges already address these factors and that it is not necessary, although the court has the discretion, it is not necessary to go above the minimum guideline sentence. Okay. Anything else? No, Your Honor. Thank you. No, Your Honor. Let me just take a couple minute break. Yes, sir. And then we'll come back and call the next Thank you. All rise. Just gonna have a seat with your uh,
So in case number 2021 CF 1121, the first thing is just by way of explanation so interested parties can understand how the court makes this decision or what are the criteria. In order to deviate below the minimum guidelines, and the minimum guidelines are kind of a complicated factor of severity of the offense past criminal activity, et cetera. So a very complex um, set of criteria that comes up with uh, minimum guidelines. In order to deviate uh, in a downward way, the defense must prove that there is a basis for that deviation downward. It's called a downward deviation in the you heard the defense arguing. Uh, if I find that the defense has made, uh, has, has met its burden in proving factors of a downward departure, the court would then have discretion to downwardly depart. Okay, so that's the criteria, and uh, the court has the option to based on the circumstances to go above that and based on aggravating factors even substantially above that. So my first finding is that the court is uh, making a finding that the defense did not meet its obligation with regards to a downward departure. Or it does not find that this was a willing participant. I understand why that argument is made, but you cannot have a willing participant in the circumstances of a, of a, of a young child. And as it relates to it being an isolated incident and unsophisticated, the court finds that neither of those criteria are met. This was not an isolated incident. And actually speaks that it was quite an extensive, elongated incident with over 1,500 contacts uh, that argues against that. And while there is some um, meant something you could, in, in the broadest sense of the word, argue that there was a mental illness, It does not meet the criteria as it relates to this downward departure. In other words, uh, he was not substantially impaired from understanding the nature of the action. And the same goes for a mental disorder. Yes, there is uh, certainly some indication of possible depression. Um, there was certainly at that time, after the, after he was arrested, but it does not meet the requirement for um, to meet the obligation to downwardly depart. So the court finds that has not met that obligation, and the court would secondarily say even if it meets the obligation, the court doesn't find that the totality of the circumstances would justify it. Or it does not. There, there are some, some aggravating factors and based on the youth and the vulnerability and the extenuating circumstances, uh, the extent, extensive circumstances of this crime. Uh, as a result of all of the above, the court would uh, order that there be an adjudication of guilt, 144 months in the Department of Corrections, followed by 10 years sex offender probation, 
designation as a sexual offender as required by 943.0435. Then there are the statutory requirements to complete sex offender treatment, DNA samples, comply with statutory registration, no contact with the victim or families, no unsupervised contact with any minors, no use of devices capable of internet access, no access to social media, etc. cetera. Limitations on phone capacity, forfeiture of electronic devices, 867 in court costs and a GPS monitor while on probation as required by the Just for Jessica Lungsford Act. That would be at $1. The remainder uh, of the probation, the fees would be waived. Anything further? Yes, sir. The court did have a copy of the score sheet. Is that correct? Additional copy. Uh, I'm yes. The we did have one. I don't know if we. There's an original. I can bring one up to the court if you. Yeah, want. you do. I yes, there was. I, I'm I'm certain there was one in my packet, but I, it's a large packet. Upon uh, Mr. Torres Brito's release from uh, the Department of Corrections, uh, he'll be placed on probation. Does the court have any objection to him transferring that supervision to New York State, uh, assuming all the uh, interstate <coughs> compact uh, requirements are met? Mr. Barry, anything? I, I'm when he gets ready to be released from the Department of Corrections, he will tell his release officer these things, and they will ahead and try to expedite the transfer to uh, New, York. New York. New York. And unlike other cases where GPS or yes, the monitor won't go, <coughs> this one will go with him up there. Okay. And they will put their own up. I'm not opposed to it, so I mean, you just have to follow the proper yes, sir. Will regulations. Yeah, you may. We agree it is, Your Honor. Madam Clerk. Yes, the, these are the um, – well, let's make sure. So would these all be concurrent it will, for all the counts? That's a good question. Thank you. Your Honor, we do have second and third degree felonies. Right. That's what I was – So, Your Honor, our recommendation is what we have is on counts one through three – they're second degree felonies. We would suggest that the DOC sentence be on those counts and they run concurrent with each other. Then, Your Honor, we would recommend that we have counts four through 12 are all third degree felonies. And we recommend that those all run consecutive to counts one through four. And concurrent with each other, and then we have 13 through 18. Again, second degree felonies, but we recommend that those run consecutive to 1 through 4 and 5 through 12 for the remaining five years. Mr. Couch, any objection to Your Honor, structuring it in that fashion? I, mean, I was trying to follow it, I know you were too. Yes, sir. I, I, I'm trying to do the math in my head, but uh, ultimately, he's going to be sentenced to 144 months, uh, Department of Corrections. And however, uh, the state and uh, Department of Corrections want to break that up, it's fine. Okay. Followed by the 10 years. Yes, sir. Followed by 10 years pro uh, probation. Okay. Very and good. I will check with Madam Clerk afterwards, make sure we're on the same page, if you like. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. All right. They're going to take you into custody. Okay. Alicia Gee Galloway. Your 
Sure, there's a related case with Mr. Hardy, and uh, I think they've got a short action that they could do. If you wanted to pass us briefly. Okay. Ryan Hardy with Michael Galloway, 21 CF 1895. And your honor, Mr. Galloway and I have agreed to discharge me from this case and I filed a motion to withdraw uh, that Mr. Galloway signed. So I would ask the court to grant my motion to withdraw. How would that impact our, our hearing today? I would assume Mr. Galloway would ask for a continuance, but Eight. Judge, given that the motion was signed by the defendant, in fact, we ask we defer to the court. We would ask that the defendant. So what's your, what's your plan as far as legal representation, Mr. Galloway? Are you, do you have somebody in place to represent yourself or are you planning to represent, excuse me, are you planning to represent yourself or? Uh, I was going to ask that the court appoint a public defender. Somebody's got to give me a basis why why this is happening. Well, Your Honor, Mr. Galloway is... If not, in the absence of that, it just looks like a ploy to delay this sentencing it's, it's here It's not a ploy to delay the sentencing, Your Honor. I'm Mr. not saying it's on you. I'm just saying right. it just it appears that way. Mr. Galloway's got certain conditions he hasn't, he hasn't met, some things he hasn't done. We've had discussions. He agreed to discharge me. Uh, once, once he does that, I'm required to file a motion to withdraw, which is what I've done. And Mr. Hardy, you are relieved. Thank you, Your Honor. Got an order? Uh, we supplied one through, you, through Ms. Eileen, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Need me, Your Honor? I'm sorry? Do you need me for anything? Uh, yeah, you got a sentencing. <laughs> so the state... So what's, your, what's your position, Mr. Galloway? You fired your attorney on the eve of the sentence. What are you asking the court to do? I'd ask for a, a continuance and for a public need, You need to tell me why, why, why he was fired and what, what, what the circumstances are that I should do that. Is your, you, you chose to, to uh, fire the attorney. I, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of cloaked in secrecy as far as why that happened, whether he was not operating in it's, some fashion that you... It was multiple things, Your Honor, but mainly there was a financial aspect that I could not meet due to the scope of everything within the family. Mm -hmm. um, we disagreed on a few things. Ultimately, it came down to the finances and... Got to 
go ahead and appoint the public defender. Given that you said to the court in front of you, I don't know if you have additional questions about the public defender or anything you want to Oh, yeah. Yeah. I can hand this one off. I would suggest <laughs> Monday morning. Who? Who's up first Monday morning? Who's the, who's Miss Gooden? Miss Gooden. Who's on at 1.30? I'm just, my mind blanked out who the council. At 1.30 is Mr. Russell. Mr. Russell. Okay. So why don't we, uh, I'm going to appoint the public defender, and we're going to have a hearing at 1.30 on Monday. Okay? It's just a status conference. I'm not going to take any substantive action. But you need to be here. And figure out where we're going and you know how long it's going to take for them to, to get up to speed um, you might want to call their office first thing in the morning or this afternoon and try and get up with them although they're going to be busy preparing for some things next week so Monday that would be 11 14 right 11 14 at 1 30 for a status conference, status on sentencing. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. You're excused. Alicia Gee Galloway. Your Honor. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Michael Gilbert on behalf of Alicia G. Galloway. We reconvene 21 CF 1887 for sentencing. We filed a motion for downward departure and a sentencing recommendation. <clears throat> there was also a PSI conducted and the state has submitted their own sentencing recommendation. And this case is related to two others, one that you just dealt with. Your Honor, this is a case of a mother who for five years was the primary parent until days prior to the incident here. The child had never been left overnight with anyone else. When Mr. Stubbs, the girl's estranged father, suddenly refused to return the child at the scheduled end of her first overnight visit with him, as he had tried to do several times before, she confronted him and wrongly tried to regain her child, resulting in serious charges, carrying substantial prison time. She's pleaded no contest to those charges. Defense intends to demonstrate today that valid mitigating factors exist in her case and that downward departure from the sentencing guidelines is warranted. The court is familiar with our position through our filing. I'd like to call four witnesses and then the defendant. Reserve argument for the end. Who do you wish to call first? You Ms. can go ahead and sit down if you want, seeing that we're going to. Ms. Bird, who's available on Zoom, Your Honor.
how many zoom? Looks like it's about a quarter of the way through. Nobody is in as of yet. Bert, can you hear me? No, she's still connecting. Okay, you can. Can you hear me, ma'am? Yes. Okay, we cannot hear you. Hold on, hold on. You're right. There you go. No, that's all right. Oh no. <laughs> okay. Allison. No, no, no. We. I think we got it. It was on our end. Okay. Here. Where'd you go? Miss Bird? Al! <laughs> no, we're good. We can hear you. Can you hear me? Al! Miss Bird, can you hear me? No. Yeah, I lost it. Talking to the judge, and he said that he couldn't hear me, and I hit unmute, and the page went down. Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, All right, connecting. I'm back. Now, wait, help me find the... I don't know how to use the volume. Still connecting. I'm nervous, Rick. Okay, the volume's up. So now what? Can you hear me, Miss Bird? Um, how do I join audio, right? No. Actually, I'm nervous. Still connecting. Audio. There you go. There you go. There you go. Right. You've got two devices. You've got to disconnect from one of them. Okay. You're up. Okay. Now, can you hear me? I can. Okay, and we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Okay, so, ma'am, would you please raise your right hand? Let me swear you in, please. Okay. Do you swear or affirm that the information you're about to provide this court is the truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Okay. Mr. Gilbert, this is, I know you can't see the attorney, but he can see you. Okay. Unfortunately, you can only see me. We don't, probably we didn't get this hooked up over here. It's my bad. So, Mr. Gilbert, if you can't hear him, just let me know, Ms. Bird. Would okay. you, you may proceed, Mr. Gilbert. Thank you, Your Honor. Speaking of that, Ms. Mike, good. Ms. Bird, can you hear me? Yes, hi. Great. Uh, what was your relationship to Ms. G. Galloway? I was a family friend. And I what? met her mother in, okay. I guess, around 2010. Okay. And oh, so, hold, on, hold on a second. Ms. Bird, would you please... State your full name and spell your last name. Donna Bird, B-I-R-D. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Gilbert. That was the court reporter. And so, I'm sorry, you said you've known her for how long? Uh, about 12 years. 
Very good. And how have you known her? I'm sorry? How have you known her? What Through what activities? What relationship? I met her through her mother. I worked with her mother. Okay. And how would you describe her as uh, in the years that you've known her as a young adult? As a young adult, she was fun and had a lot of friends, great job, outgoing, you know, did anything for anybody, was always willing to do something for you if you needed something. Okay. And then what happened? Uh, she, uh, she met Mr. Stubbs and got pregnant, had the baby, and just her whole life changed. She just became almost like a recluse. She just was petrified all the time. She were was there, a totally different person. Now, were there incidents that may have caused that? Uh, yeah, yeah, there were. And what were they? Uh, one, I remember um, after the baby was born, uh, we were all having dinner at her house, kind of a little celebration, and uh, Mr. Stubbs came to visit the baby unannounced, and he wanted to take her outside, and Alicia said no, that he could, you know, stay in the house with us and see the baby, and he, you know, wasn't happy with that, but... Uh, so he did stay in the house with the baby, but he wanted the door open. And Alicia was like, no, we'll close the door. And he still wanted the door open, so she left the door open. And, you know, we were all kind of suspicious. But next thing you know, it was out the door and down the steps with the baby. And we were all, in, you know, in pursuit, chasing him. So he took, and, off, he took off out the door with the baby? Is that what you said? Yeah. Yes. He literally ran down two flights of stairs with the infant, and we all went after him, and he would not give, you know, we kind of surrounded him, he wouldn't give the baby back. He wouldn't give him back to her mother. And police came, he wouldn't give the baby back to the police. And, uh, you know, it really was a, like a big thing. And then finally, of course, he did give the baby back, but it was... I mean, she was just petrified that he was going to do it again. Were there other incidents? Uh, there was, I didn't see anything else where he took the baby, but, like, I know when she... He was just, like, very controlling. And when she had... When she was in labor and in the hospital, she kind of had this plan where her cousin was going to be in the delivery room with her. And... You know, the plan was made, her mom was there, they were all going to be involved. And all of a sudden, like, he came in, and next thing you know, we were all thrown out of the room. The birthing plan was changed. He was in there instead of her mother and her cousin. And, uh, you know, it was just like he came in and everything was different. Right. Do you know what year this event where you say you tried to take the child was? Uh, but, but, but. 2016. And how did that affect Alicia? She she just changed totally. Like she immediately packed up and moved. She was just so afraid of him taking the baby. Like, she moved? Yeah, she moved back down to um, Bradenton. She, like, literally, like, wouldn't leave her house. If, there, if someone pulled up outside of her house, like, delivering a pizza across the street, she was freaking out thinking it was him coming. Like, she became almost, like, like nuts over it. You know, she was so afraid of losing that baby that he was going to take that baby. It was, like, her whole, her whole, just world changed, you know. Her whole demeanor changed, her attitude. She was different. She was just not the same kid that she was before all this. What else would you like to tell the court about Alicia and your experience with her? Just that what happened is just so out of character, and I know she's so remorseful from all of this, and, you know, she was just so, like, that child was her life, and losing her, just, you know, it, she just, what happened just is not her. You know, she just was just like such a great person. And, you know, to 
to be in this situation now is it's just not good for her like it's not her anything else you would like to tell the court um, just that I hope you'll have leniency with her and you know she's she just really is a wonderful person and you know all right thank you ma'am I don't have any questions yeah. for Miss Bird all right Anything else? No, Your Honor. Okay. Very good. Ms. Bird, I'm going to go ahead and disconnect you, okay? Okay. Thank you for your help. Okay. Thank you. Next, I'd like to call Ms. Alicia Revel. And would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm the information you're about to provide this court is the truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? And please uh, be seated, ma'am. Just make sure and talk right into that mic. Go ahead, Mr. Gilbert. Very good. What is your relationship with Mrs. Would you identify who she is? Uh, yes. Uh, well, will you please state your name? What's your relationship with Ms. G. Galloway? Um, she's one of my best friends, who I consider my sister. Um, would you, re would you repeat your name? Uh, my name is Alicia Revel, last name R-E-V-E-L-L. -L. Thank you. Yes, sir. And your relationship to Ms. G. Galloway? Um, I would call her my sister, but she's been my best friend for years. And how long have you known her? Um, I believe since 2004. And how much of your lives have you shared together? Um, a lot. Um, um, in 2004, we were going to junior high together, and we went through all of high school together. Um, and during those years, her family took me in, and I lived with her for a certain amount of years. Um, and... We only had some time apart during college, um, but after that we met again and hung out almost every other weekend or whatever time I could get. How would you describe um, her personality growing up, particularly in the later years as a young adult? Um, she was a very hard worker, very motivated. She always had a job, always had good grades, always had her homework done weeks before it would ever be due. Um, a lot that my family probably wished I was more like her growing up, but she was a, a good person, a great person that I was glad to call my friend. So you knew her to be a good person? Yes. And then what happened? Um, we, after graduating high school, um, we were both going to go to college together, but I stayed home to take care of family. Um, and so that's when we separated for a couple of years. And then we met back up whenever she moved back to Bradenton. Okay, and how was she then? Um, she was different. Um, everything that she did from then on out was about her daughter. Um, it wasn't like it was when we were in high school or trying to, you know, have a fun night here doing this, making plans for the girls. Any plan that she had for any day was about what could benefit her daughter um, to whatever types of practices, school, learning things, her birthdays or anything like that. That was all the plans would ever be. I knew if I was coming down, I'm coming to a child's event and <laughs> you know i'm hanging out and being the fun auntie and i know i'm not doing adult things going we're not going to the club we're not doing those things it was always about her daughter so she really took on the mother role yes very well now were there incidents that concerned you that you saw between as, her and her as daughter? time went on um not any bad incidents with her and her daughter. I know that 
um, there were times of where I could tell she had like a, a lot of stress on her and always worried about what her well-being of her daughter that to some people might have seemed like a little overly done but um, from what I've heard and have seen that she's been through I understand now well, what have you seen that she's been through um, there was there was an incident to where I know um, the father of her daughter um, came and with his family and were threatening his, her mother is this what you saw yourself yes sir um, because I was there because I tried to come around every other weekend to spend time with the children besides her daughter and the nieces. just asking that but you saw this yourself yes sir okay and what did you see I saw um, him and his brother threatening her mother while being like a foot away from each other while they had like their hands in her face calling out of her name and things like that okay and so they had a family disagreement of some kind um i believe that was his first visit and things were said like he was going to be taking her for like a night stay but that wasn't the case and they got into an argument and the cops had to be called okay so the police were called to this incident yes sir All right. and you saw that yourself yes sir and what year was that um, <coughs> I believe 2019 in yeah, 2019 December and what else did you observe um, with him not so much i never saw him present um, I just was witness two times where I know she was extremely worried about her daughter's well-being and of feeling like anything could happen at any time so for instance, the 2019 incident, you think that affected her? Yes. Okay, how? Um, because having someone come the first day there and already starting issues and yelling and calling people out their name to where the police had to come, that's I feel like threatening right. to her life. And you saw this affect her? Yes. What else would you like to tell the court regarding Alicia? Um, not just saying this because I consider my own family, but how I was raised, I went through um, a lot of trauma with my family, and I don't really have much connections and examples of parental, parental people positions. But Alicia is the picture perfect mother in my eyes of what I've seen and I don't believe anyone could raise a child as well as she has her own daughter thank you the state I don't have any questions for this witness That's all I have thank you very much ma'am you step down yes sir Gilbert so Miss Andrea G My next witness went out to get the Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the information you're about to provide this court is the truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, sir. Please be seated and talk right into that mic, please. Gotcha. Mr. Gilbert. 
Please state your name for the record. Andrea G. And what is your relationship to Ms. G. Gowdy? <coughs> I'm her sister. So how much of your lives have you shared together? Our entire lives. And how would you describe her personality growing up, particularly in her later years as a young adult? Um, she was always a very big, by the book, rule follower. She was either going to school or going to work. That was it. That's who she was. She was always a very good child. And did that change? No. Okay. Uh, after she had the child, uh, what did you observe? Um, she became very distant, and in our family, that's not normal. We are a very big family people. We're together every single holiday. We're getting together probably once, twice a week just to get together and hang out, and she completely became closed off. She stopped hanging out with us, stopped coming over. Very would only get together for like the big holidays, and even then she was very shut off. She was always in a corner, never with the family. Okay, and what did you attribute that to? Her boyfriend at the time. And did you see any behaviors of the, the boyfriend around her or anything that gave you concern? Yes, there was an incident in which I was home when they were living with us and my parents. And they were having an argument. Uh, they were in the garage, and I had came out because it had gotten pretty loud. And when I had gotten into the garage, he had his hands around her throat at the time. And so I had yelled at him to stop, and he did. And so I had left the room to go call my parents and tell them they needed to come home. And during that time, he decided he was le gonna leave. And he was gone before my parents came home but my sister had decided not to call the police or anything or press any charges or do anything about that. But you saw this yourself? Yes. Were there any other incidents? Um, between them two that I saw, no. Okay. Uh, was there an incident in... Okay, I got you. And how did this affect Alicia? It affected her tremendously. Um, she became a very close person. She wasn't as happy and bubbly. Um, she became very just closed off. She stopped hanging out with friends. She stopped hanging out with family. Her and Ivani were just shut-ins. They stayed in the apartment every day, all day. She didn't do anything. What else would you like to tell the court regarding Alicia? I would like the court to know that my sister is probably the best person that I've ever met and also the most law-abiding citizen that you could ever come across. She's never been in trouble. She's not someone who does crazy things. She's not a drinker. She doesn't do drugs. She's never been in trouble. She's just not that person. Her life consists of work and her daughter, and that's it. Were you aware of the 2016 incident? In which Mr. Stubbs tried to take the child? Yes. Yes, I was there for that. You saw that? Yes. Well, would you describe that, please? Uh, we were having a family dinner, hanging out at the, uh, Alicia's apartment, and Cyril had came over for to see Ivani, and he decided he was going to sit on the arm of the couch by the door. He didn't close the front door, and I thought it was very odd, so I watched him the whole time he was there. Probably about 10, 15 minutes in, he decided to bolt out the door and down a flight of stairs, maybe 15, 16 stairs. And I was the one who ended up going behind him because my sister was still recovering from a C-section. And I had to have him pinned against the wall until the police came because he refused to give the child back. You chased him down yourself? Correct. And then, I'm sorry, you said the police arrived? Yeah, the police had to be called because he refused to give the child back. Okay, and what happened after that? How did it get resolved? Um, the police were not going to do anything. They were said it was a civil matter, but then... Cyril got mouthy with the officers, and they ended up telling him he needed to give the child back to the parent that was taking care of her. So how did this affect Alicia? That was the event in which changed her completely. We, Avani wasn't allowed to do anything, go anywhere, unless it was with Alicia or my mom. Uh, I was Avani's main source of like babysitter while my sister went to work Monday through Fridays, but we weren't allowed to go anywhere or do anything. We were in the apartment from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. every single day because she was in fear for her life, but also for her daughter. She didn't want her daughter to be kidnapped.
What else would you like to tell the court regarding your issue? Um, that I believe jail time would not serve her any purpose. I believe, yes, she made a mistake. She has been severely remorseful ever since the incident happened. If she could go back, she would change it in a heartbeat. But she was acting out of fear and trauma. She was terrified for her daughter, and she just wanted her daughter home and to be safe. And she's been in fear ever since. Now she can't live a normal life. Thank you. Stay tuned. Any questions for this witness? I, I wasn't clear. The first event you described. Yes, sir. When did that occur? Um, it was before the baby was born, so t early 2016, maybe. Or no, it'd be 2015. And she... Where did this occur? It was my parents' house. They were staying at my parents' house with us. They were staying, who was staying? Her and Cyril Stubbs, my sister, and Cyril. They lived at your house? Mm -hmm. How long did they live at your house? Um, I believe he was there maybe two, three months, and she was there her whole pregnancy, and a little bit after. Who else lived at the house? Just me and then my mom and my dad. So you, your mom, your dad, Alicia, your sister, mm -hmm. and Cyril. Cyril. Mm -hmm. So the five of you lived together. Yes. And you all lived together for like three months? Mm hmm Well, with him, and then she stayed. Right. Correct. She stayed alone. Yeah. That's all I've got. Anything out of that raise any other questions? No, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Now call Mr. G. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm the information you're about to provide this court is the truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Please be seated. Talk right into that mic, please. Gilbert. Good afternoon, sir. Will you please state your name for the record? My name is Andrew G. G E E. And your relationship to Mrs. G? She's my daughter. Your daughter? And have you lived your entire lives? Together, and how, how much of that time has been together? She's been in my life since she was three years old. How would you describe her growing up, particularly in her young adult years? In her young adult years, she was a hard worker, um, great student. Um, she just made sure in high school she worked. She didn't go to, to school until second period because she had all her stuff done. And then she went to college. And she was uh, working and going to school at that time. And then at one point, she worked and worked two jobs and went to, college, went to school. So she was happy, go lucky, had a purpose, and knew what she wanted to do. And she was doing anything to get that done. And then what happened? And then she met Mr. Stubbs, um, and then her demeanor changed. She started being withdrawn, um, timid, something that's completely out of character for her. And then just changed into a different person. Then she ended up getting pregnant, and then there was the incident that my daughter just talked about, about him laying hands on her. And 
That's when he left the house. And from that point on, they stayed together, kind of, and the abuse was getting, verbal abuse at that point was getting worse. And it's just withdrawn her and a lot. And did you see this abuse you're talking about personally, or is this? No. Okay. No. No, I didn't. I did not. Um, did you see that, the that, effects? That, effects. I saw the, the effect afterwards. Yes, the, that day it happened. I wasn't there, so by the time I did get home, he wasn't there. Um, but I saw marks. I saw the devastation on her, and then we found out everything else that went on. So yeah, it it changed her considerably. And the event. In 2016, were you around that? Again, okay, for the actual this. thing, no. The first incident was uh, after the house was the birth of, of, of my granddaughter, where he ushered everyone out of the room um, and made the birthing plant process different than what it was already in set for. Um, so how did this affect Alicia? Well, it, you saw that in that room, the most troublesome, scariest time for a female is having a child. Um, you saw her nervous, not happy because of what the situation. She was more timid, afraid. Um, of what was going on and I guess him and so without us in there once we was able to come in and everything else it was it was a scary moment at that time uh, others have talked of this 2016 event you weren't there this is the one um, at the apartment unfortunately no I was not okay there. but after that did you see a change in her yes, and yes. What was she that? was she was more protective, um, scared, I guess it, it, it's the word, of uh, being alone, leaving her alone, um, thinking he was going to come back and hurt her, hurt, hurt her child, take her child. So it was more guarded and a, no, I, I guess I'm not a doctor, so I can't say something like PTSD, but you can see that the stem of everything that happened, including that moment of losing her child, affected her from that point till now. What else would you like to tell the court regarding your daughter? Regarding my daughter? Well, like I always said, we make a joke of it. She's my favorite one because she was the good daughter. Um, but after the December of 19 an incident where um, he was having his f very first visit after f five years, well, almost five years, um, and then coming saying that he had a pickup order for her, and which wasn't true naturally, and then threatening my wife, and then us having to ca call the police again. Um, that was, I guess, a, a so real moment for me because I was actually there for the, this first incident. And it ended better than we thought it would, but from that point on, she was on guard 24 7. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. Do you have any questions for this witness? Thank you, Mr. Gay. Let's now call uh, Miss Alicia G. Galloway. Please come forward. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the information you're about to provide this court is the truth, nothing but the truth, so I hope you got it. Please be seated.
Please state your name for the record. Alicia G. Galloway. Can you tell the court briefly about your childhood and early adulthood? Um, it was pretty normal, um, or I thought it was normal, but <laughs> I was kind of always the nerdy kid that, <laughs> you know, I stuck to the books and everything. So you were a good student? Yes, I was a really good student. What were your grades? Like a 4.5 GPA and 5.3 if it's weighted or unweighted. I forget how that works, but I took dual enrollment classes throughout high school. And were there other notable activities or? Um, Future Business Leaders of America, Honor Roll, um, Honor Society, FFA, um, 4-H. I did a lot of different clubs and stuff. Like I said, I was pretty nerdy. <laughs> and I, you earned college credit while you were in high school, too? That's correct. Can you tell the court about your relationship with Mr. Stubbs? Um, it was brief. Um, very unhealthy, abusive. Um, something I had never experienced before. And how did the things you experienced affect you? It's, it's definitely changed me. Um, you know, I'm a more, um, I would hate to say it, but more pessimistic person. I don't take people for their word, um, but more so their actions. Um, like I said, it was a learning experience. Are there instances where you feared for the safety of you and your daughter? Several. Call the court, please. Um, there were uh, numerous incidences where I was held at gunpoint, and um, there were numerous incidents where he threatened my family and, uh, well, my unborn daughter at the time, and then eventually when she was born, her as well. And were there specific instances you could tell the court about? Um, yes. Uh, like mentioned before, there were um, several instances while I was pregnant um, where there was a lot of abuse. Um, and then once uh, our daughter was born in the hospital, uh, I w he, was, he threatened me and told me that I had to put her name or give her his last name and put his name on the birth certificate. Um, when I disagreed um, in front of the notary, he asked the notary to step out and said he would have me bake racked it. And when I told him that that wouldn't stand, he uh, threatened my family and Avani saying that that's all that I cared about anyways. So ultimately I did put his name on the birth certificate and give her his last name. Witnesses have testified about an incident in 2016. What was going on in that time? Um, so, like I said, um, I made a commitment when I was pregnant with our daughter that I didn't want to raise her in an abusive household. I did a lot of research. Um, you know, I read a lot of studies. And, but at the end of the day, I wanted to make sure that I provided him with every opportunity to be a part of her life. Um, so after she was born, I would um, attempt to meet up with him to have to allow him to have visitation with her, um, but immediately that didn't work. There was an instance, I believe February 17, 2016, that is when he um, first held her against the will, her will, and locked me out of the house, and I had to threaten to call the police, and he told me, you can do that. We already know how that works. Um, he was referencing a time when he had taken his other child, and there had to be an emergency pickup order for that situation. That was the first time he tried to take Avani. Um, there was another instance on March 8th when I filed my first uh, injunction. Uh, there was another instance that they described with him running down the stairs. 
that was April 10th of 2016. Um, at that instance, the police again reiterated that I file a restraining order. They also put me in touch with the uh, Hubbard House, which is the domestic violence group shelter up there in Jacksonville. And they helped me uh, devise an escape plan to relocate closer to my family in South Florida. And did you get a police report from them? I did, yes. Your Honor, may I approach? Yes. Mr. Gilbert, is this part of your sentencing attachments? Is this one of your sentencing attachments? Yes. So how would you like me to label it, Your Honor? I can Police report from that event? Yes, um, I believe it was April 10th or April 11th, 2016. You mentioned that you were aware that in a previous time uh, he had failed to return a child? Yes, he had relocated out of the county um, with his first child um, and she had to file an emergency pickup order which was ultimately denied she had to go and retrieve the child herself yes it is any objection to Fences exhibits one or two. No, Your Honor. We'll admit these into evidence. So you are aware. This is documentation of what you were aware of, right? Correct. Okay, and so as we get further along, now we're into where uh, we're into say 2021. Did something happen then that caused problems between you and Mr. Stubbs? Leading, leading up to the incident you're referring to? Yes. Yes. Um, well, my husband and I had uh, recently gotten married in March, and um, we decided to file a step parent adoption and legal name change for our daughter because. Her biological father, Mr. Stubbs, was not involved in her life, and when he did show up, it was very sporadic and very limited. Um, so we wanted to go ahead and legally pursue an adoption. So when, when we were doing that, uh, naturally, the first steps we took were to send him the documentation first um, before filing it, and that set off a chain of reactions. Same thing, and this was in our... Yes. You may. And do we have an order? Any objection, State? No, Your Honor. You offering this as an exhibit, Counsel? Yes, Your Honor. Or will accept defenses D without objection. And there was an order establishing a parental time sharing? So at that time in 2021, the order establishing a parenting plan was dated for 2017. Um, there were a couple of revisions to that order um, that basically said that in order for him to utilize the parenting plan in place, he needed to complete five consecutive supervised visits. Um, because they were never completed. So he was still working off those original five supervised visits in 2021. But this is the order that y'all were working on, working off of 
Correct. Apply Correct. At this time. Correct. After we filed the step parent adoption, he decided he wanted to utilize visitation. So the judge ordered him to comply and complete the remaining of the five visits before resuming the full parenting plan, which would be the, the remainder of the summer break ending two weeks prior to the start of school. And that year was August 10th. Your Honor, I entered um, or offer this. This is also. This is defense for that objection. Court will accept defenses for without objection. So, say it again, please. How did this visit come into being? So, like I said, we filed the step parent adoption, and then at that point, Mr. Stubbs decided he wanted to utilize his time sharing that had already been in play for five and a half years that he didn't utilize. So he was completing the remaining of those five supervised visits. And then this was supposed to be his first unsupervised visit is what it was. And it, it ended up being the end of summer, you know, the summer break. And what did you do in preparation for this visit? Um, a lot because it was a lot for her. You know, to him, he was essentially a stranger. You know, she had only seen him, an, you know, a few hours in her entire life. Um, and on numerous occasions, he had tried to take her. So she had already had that fear. Um, so, you know, we, we talked with her. We established, you know, a code phrase in case there was an emergency, in case she was scared. Um, I had already been dealing with the Army CID unit. At Eglin, um, for an, they were investigating Mr. Stubbs for some other abuse allegations for his ex-wife. So I was already in contact with them, and I informed them that I thought it might be a problem sending her, that I was afraid. Um, I had already worked with my family law attorney who was trying to put a proper uh, supplemental petition in place um, that would address the fact that the current parenting plan wasn't appropriate given that it was not used for so long. Okay. So what was supposed to happen? So um, we dropped her. We were supposed to meet up on that Saturday and uh, in Lake City um, and drop her off. And then the pickup time would have so been... So Lake City's what, like a middle? Halfway, yes, sir. Uh -huh. um, so we were supposed to meet there on Saturday and then um, meet there again on that Tuesday for pickup. Okay, so what happened? Um, well, he was 45 minutes late for the drop-off. Um, and then, she, you know, she went for those three days. Uh, during the visit, he disagreed with the date. He wanted to keep her longer. He felt he was entitled to a longer visit. Um, but that didn't, course, well, didn't correlate with the order. Um, I contacted the judge's assistant in the family court through Duval, who verified that there were no modifications to the order that we needed to stick with the order in place. Um, and ultimately, he told me he wasn't returning her. He also had requested shot records and filed a pre he prematurely filed a supplemental petition to relocate with her here to Okaloosa, even though he, this was his first visit. Okay, so what did you do? So um, the day... I, th I believe it was the day before he told me he wasn't going to return her. Um, so the next day we came up here. Um, my intention was to try to find out where she was. Um, I was afraid that he might relocate her either onto the base, out of the county or state, because this was a temporary position for him. Um, in doing so, I also, like I said, reached out to the Army CID unit officer and the staff surgeon at Evelyn. I contacted the police. Um, I spoke with a Sergeant White or Officer White and asked him if there was anything that they could help me do to, to get her return. What they tell you? They told me that it was a civil matter and there was nothing that I could do. Um, that they, I needed to resolve it through family court, in which case I contacted my family law attorney and we were working on filing those documentations and getting those notarized. Okay, so what were you doing? Where'd you go? Um, so we were at the courthouse. 
Um, <coughs> I was trying to get these papers notarized and sent back over to my family law attorney. Then what happened? And then we were, we were driving down the road. Um, my mom was driving. I was sitting in the passenger seat. And I just remember him coming from a side street onto the main highway, uh, almost like he blew a stop sign or a yield sign or something. And he was just driving recklessly. He was driving on the sidewalk and over uh, fire hydrants. And um, it was just, it was horrible, you know. I. Um, I just remember thinking, I hope Alani is not in the car because I know she's got to be terrified. And then I just, everything started coming back to me. Every time he threatened me, not knowing what could happen to her. So when the car came to a stop, I went up to the car to check on her. I saw she was in the car. She was screaming. She was crying. She was reaching for me. She just kept saying, Mommy, Mommy. She, she was trying to open the door. And they wouldn't let her out. They just wouldn't let her out. What'd you do? I broke the window to try to get her out. Yeah. I just, I just wanted to hold her. I wanted her to feel safe. I wanted her to know that I was there and to put her in my arms. And when I tried to do that, um, the uh, everything just was happening so fast, and it just seemed. It, it was my worst nightmare, and it just seemed like a a horrible movie or a video game. It just didn't seem real. And the next thing I know, um, uh, Keisha Teary had her by her arms, and Mr. Stubbs had her pulling her by her hair, and they were trying to keep her in the car. And I just remember having my hands underneath her armpits, holding her, but not wanting to pull her because I didn't want to hurt her. And so at this point, I was just trying to let her go, but I was stuck on the car. And at this point in time, he uh, backed up, ran into my husband, and drove off with me attached to the car. And uh, I was just trying not to get ran over at that point. And uh, eventually, they stopped the car, and my foot got ran over, and I was just in the middle of the highway. Were you aware of what else was going on around you? No. Did you know where your mother was? No, even playing it back, I don't see her. Did you know that she had ended up shooting a gun? I didn't know at the time. I, let me clarify. I did not hear or see a gun in any way at the time, and quite frankly, I didn't believe it. I mean, after all this happened, there was talk about a gun being used, but I just thought it was a crazy rumor because there were also rumors that my dad was up here, a part of the incident when he was six hours away at work. There was a rumor that my husband fled the scene, but he was bay flighted. So, I, di I didn't think it was real. I, I just, it's unlike my mom. Would you have wanted her to do that? No. You've discussed the wrongness of what you did. In your own words, would you please tell the court? You know, that day I, I'm ashamed of what I did. Not because 
of what has occurred because of it, but because it's not like me. If, if I was in my right frame of mind at the time, I would have never done it. You know, it just, something came over me and made me feel like I had to, to get her out of there. I had to rescue her. And I know some people in here may judge me and think, what kind of mother could break the window for a child that's in there? But it's the feeling of having your kid taken from you and not knowing and the helpless feeling that they're in danger and doing, wanting to do anything to protect them. And I know that I did it the wrong way. I 100% agree with that. And I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. Up until now, you've been bound by a strict no contact order. Uh, Mr. Stubbs and Mr. Ear here, what would you say to them? Keisha, I would say that I'm... I am so sorry. Because as a mother, I can't even imagine how that must have been for you and those girls. And I would also say thank you for being there for Ivani when I have not been able to right now. You have no idea what that means to me. And I would have said it sooner had I been able to, but I couldn't. And I wanted to make sure that I followed the rules. I'm truly sorry for anything, for any trauma that I caused them. That is something that I will live with every day and I will never forget myself. And so I would say, I read your statement, and I do not hate you. Aside from this incident, I have a lot of reasons to, but I do not. This was not out of hate. This is because I felt like Avani was in danger, and yes, I did the wrong thing. I'm not denying that. And the fact that you feel like you've had to watch over your shoulder, I am sorry for that. Because as anybody here sitting here today will tell you, I, I lived like that for five and a half years, and it's the worst feeling in the world. And I wouldn't wish that on anybody, even you. So I am sorry. Since the event, uh, and once you've, once this court, allowed you to go back to family court and get some visitation and contact with the child. How's that been going? It's been going, um, well, it's good for me. It's been going good. I um, obviously dependency uh, opened a case and I worked the case plan and completed dependency. Um, and then through family court, I was finally given the ability to do supervised visits. So I'm entitled to have two Zoom calls a week um, supervised as well as in-person visits uh, whenever Mr. Stubbs agrees to them. And I've attended anyone that I've been able to, but unfortunately he's not been complying with any of when he, either of those things. Your Honor, uh, defense would offer, I guess it would be defense five. It's an affidavit from Ms. Uh, Howell, who is a uh, supervisor of the visits, and she just makes some comments of Alicia, what else would you like to tell the court? I would say I know that I made a mistake and I know that I deserve to be punished. This experience has been humbling to say the least because you, like I said, you, I'm somebody who follows the rules. I would have never thought that I would have found myself in this situation. You know, ultimately now, going through therapy, I've realized that, you know, it was triggered by past trauma 
and I now know how to deal with that. And I would say that I in no way acted out of anger. I'm not an aggressive person. I in no way intended to hurt anybody that day. I didn't try to go after anybody other than trying to rescue my daughter. And I understand that I have to be held accountable. And I'm just hoping that I can, can do that in a way that preserves the relationship between my daughter and myself because I've done everything since that day to have visitation and, and to earn my way back. And, you know, if, I, if I'm sentenced to jail or prison, you know, I won't be able to do that. Um, I won't, you know, I have to go and tell her that it could be a long time before I see her again. And she's already having such a hard time and she misses me so much for something that wasn't her fault. So I'm begging you, please, just don't send me away to where I can't be a part of my little girl's life. I've already missed a lot of time. One more question. You broke the window. How'd you break the window? Um, with a like a window breaking tool. Right. You tried to cut the seatbelt too, right? Yes, it's and a is that something that tool can do? Yes, it does both. Why you have that tool? Um the best way to explain it is I'm overly prepared. I you know, I think like I said, I think the worst, you know, what if happens if I drive off into water, how do I get out of the car? You know, I have Everything, you know, survival kits, motors, I have everything. Do you have any questions for the defendant? Thank you, ma'am. You may step down. That's our witnesses. I'd like to reserve argument for the end, Your Honor. state has no witnesses or evidence to put on very good wish to proceed closing uh, yes that is it's their burden I believe mr. Uh, Gilbert should proceed first Gilbert your honor the evidence is overwhelming that this is exactly as we presented it the case of a fearful mother who responded to her daughter being wrongly kept from her wrongly. The court now has substantial evidence upon which to find mitigating factors exist, namely that the victim was an initiator or provoker of the incident. Witnesses testified that Mr. Stubbs reacted angrily upon finding out Alicia G's intent with respect to not putting his name on the certificate and he threatened to kill the child while at the hospital. Only a year later, Mr. Stubbs appeared at the defendant's apartment and using a ruse attempted to run off with the child. Witnesses have testified that he had to be physically restrained and attempted to take the child with him and a girlfriend and invoke civil process to resolve the custody issue. Only quick family and police involvement returned the child to her mother. They told of a similar incident in 2019. Furthermore, the defendant was aware the mother of another child, Mr. Stubbs, was also filed reports with allegations that Mr. Stubbs refused to return them to their mother. Prior to the incident here, Mr. Stubbs had short visits with Avani only three times after she was born. He saw her when she was three years old in Manatee County and two times when she was five years old in Lake City. However, other than the three times referenced above, he never began to exercise his visitation until he learned that her stepfather was planning to adopt her. The visitation order ruled that Mr. Stubbs could take Avani commencing five days following the end of the school term and ending two weeks prior to school start. It should be noted that Mr. Stubbs did not begin his visitation until less than three weeks prior to school starting. This allowed only a short time with Ivani in order to have her return to her mother two weeks before school started as the order required. Consistent with his previous behavior, Mr. Stubbs refused to return her 
as required by the order. He messaged that this was in his intent. This prompted the defendant to drive to Crestview to try to consummate the child handoff as required by the order. The first wrong that day was Mr. Stubbs' refusal to comply with the family law order and return her daughter to her mother when he was supposed to. If Mr. Stubbs had complied with the family law order as required to, none of the unfortunate events in Crestview would have happened. The initial bad act was the victims. While not excusing the defendant's behavior, it is mitigating toward ultimate culpability. The offense was committed in an unsophisticated manner and was an isolated incident for which the defendant has shown remorse. State will describe the incident as the culmination of a conspiracy between codependents. The evidence shows that instead, these were the acts of a mother in panic, desperately trying to get her daughter safely back under her control from a visit that was supposed to be over. When Mr. Stubbs indicated he would not return the child at all, defendant first called authorities. She called her attorney and even went to the courthouse to address it through legal means. She first turned to the law. Unfortunately, she learned that would take substantial time. At about the same time, she learned Mr. Stubbs and her daughter were nearby and appeared to be preparing to leave the area. She saw him, the events at the intersection in broad daylight, only steps from the courthouse, are a result of a desperate mother doing what she could to secure her daughter's safety. It was a spontaneous, unplanned event that had no chance of succeeding. Description of events by witnesses indicate there was no attempt to conceal the action she took. It was done in the middle of Crestview for all to witness. The lack of sophistication and planning together with absolutely zero prior <coughs> criminal history demonstrate this mother was acting far greater out of love and instinctive motherly fear than any criminal intent. Alicia has expressed remorse for her actions to those she's allowed contacts with, that remorse is documented. Further, she has expressed her remorse to the victims here today. The defendant acted under extreme duress. In the circumstances, Alicia was under extreme duress of a mother wrongly denied her child. The law recognizes a special mother-child bond. The bond is distinguishable from that of non-parents of the child. Certain rights are only afforded parents. Certain crimes, such as child neglect, are premised on a special duty of care a mother has for her child. This legal and moral bond started at conception and as the primary supporting parent in that child's life for the first five years had developed to be very strong. When Alicia acted, she was under the psychological duress of a mother being wrongly denied her child by someone she had good reason to believe would not return that child to her. Your Honor, we believe that the preponderance of the evidence presented today meets the criteria for downward departure. Additionally, the court has substantial evidence upon which to determine that a downward departure is not only justified by mitigating factors, but that one should be made in this case. Alicia is not arguing she did nothing wrong. As she said on the stand, she did break that window and did try to get her child back. She just asked that the sentence take into account the totality of the circumstances. This was not a carjacking. The father knew her. He knew she wanted the safe return of their daughter. If he took off at high speed, as state may argue, it was to get the girl away from the mother who had raised her for the past five years and had never posed a threat to him. That was the big plan that day, child exchange. Instead, it turned into a mother on a busy street in broad daylight screaming for her child back, and now this. Mitigating factors are un understood and rigorous. Defense believe it, it has satisfied the test and that the court appreciates the rationale for downward departure. However, should the court rule that a statutory mitigating factor has not been established, it could find an articulated, a non-statutory reason for departure, the extreme emotional distress of a mother denied her child. Should the court still not find sufficient evidence of a factor under statute, <coughs> and be forced to sentence according to guidelines, then defense respectfully requests that the court suspend the incarceration portion of the sentence upon the condition of success under supervision, perhaps under the conditions contemplated in the PSI. Defense offers that a finding that she was under extreme emotional distress in the moment is well established with substantial evidence. As we went first in argument, I'd like to resort, reserve a short final comment. 
One legal question. You request as one of the alternatives that if the court is unable to determine a mitigate, the mitigating factor supply requiring the imposition of incarceration, the defense respectfully requests for any period of incarceration to be suspended. Can I do that legally? Yes, Your Honor. Under Power State 1997, any period of felony for days or years may be suspended at your discretion with a reason. I understand that, but I'm saying if, if we don't... Okay. Stay. Do you mind if my, I my understanding well, well, you're is not, it's not well, allowed. Well, if I understand the rule, the question better now, Your Honor. Well, let, I, I'm let just re I'm read your paragraph. <laughs> right. If the if I determine that that there are not mitigating factors, can I suspend the sentence? Yes, Your Honor. Well, under uh -huh. a different reason, you just can't use any legal reason. It can't be because she's too young. It can't be for those things that have been found in case law prior. What we're arguing though is fine. It's a valid reason that you find in your judgment. Uh, so the downward departure is not a requirement. I can just do what I want. No. You got, you got, yep. You got minimum guidelines. We've got to downwardly depart to vary, but to, 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 to vary from that in general. But it doesn't matter because I can really do what I want. Uh, Suspend it. Well, of course it matters, Your Honor, because well, to do that, what do I have? What, what what's the that? legal basis? I'm looking. I'm looking legal. I'm not. So it's a couple things. One, first of all, you're entrusted with that power on purpose. You're chartered with it right. to, to be able to case law. Well, if we need if we need to argue that point, well, I'm, I'm asking you. Put it down in your in your I, thing. I just, I need a legal basis for it. I mean, if, so we, down if we need case law, I'll do it. But I, I need you to articulate. I'll stop talking. I keep interrupting. <laughs> Go ahead. There are specified mitigating criteria, as you're well aware, that can justify downward departure, right? We know these, they've been tested through case law, and, and we know that there's things that the court says, yep, that works, nope, that doesn't. And that's the analysis that you're first presented with. However, of course, as the circuit judge, you have the power to suspend incarcerated portions, all of it, some of it, you have that power. And that has been kept in you uh, for the checks that it is uh, valued. You, you've seen case law. I'm not asking you to, right? You've seen case law. It says, even though there were no mitigating factors, that I can suspend the sentence. Yes, Your Honor, I believe you have to. However, I would ask the opportunity to provide you that case law. What's the state's position on this? Judge, I believe in reference to a suspended sentence, it is a downward departure. Um, as far as there still needs to be a finding of a of mitigation of some sort in order to either suspend a sentence or give a downward departure. So this is not in disagreement. It's just a different criteria than the mitigating factors used to to weight. Yeah, but, a downward but here, let me let me read read your sentence again, and you're going to answer this. If the court were unable to determine that mitigating factors apply, as your predicate. Thereby, thereby requiring the imposition of incarceration, defense requests that it be suspended. If it seemed to be contradictory. That's they, they where I'm going be, with it. They would be if we go with a very strict literal read of mitigating. I'm talking about in the context of that we do, we do with the laws. We, we uh, yes, literal sir. meaning. We're There's some other type of meaning. Okay, do we want. so if it was an artful, let me clarify it. So what you should do, I believe, is decide whether you have the prescribed mitigating factors. Because these are statutory factors. The mitigating isn't, gee, there's a mitigating factor. It has to be one of four, I think, five. It's very specific. If you can't find one of those mitigating factors, Your Honor, oh, by the way, you also have the opportunity to find a non-statutory one. Okay. And then, after that, of course, then you also have the opportunity to suspend the sentence if you determine, you determine that you have a valid reason to do it. And it can be, and probably would be, reasons other than in the mitigation uh, analysis of uh, the downward departure analysis. Uh, 
Judge, obviously there's statutory basis for downward departure. The ones at issue today are the ones in his motion for downward departure, and that's what we're focused on today. Um, we do believe a suspended sentence is a downward departure. The state does agree to it, but that's when the state agrees to it. I have to answer to that. I would just ask, is it the state's position that the only way you can suspend a sentence is if you have one of these mitigating factors? If you find there's a mitigating factor in order to do it, there has then to be you can do a downward departure. I'm talking about a suspended sentence. Yeah. I just wanted to ask the question. You can go ahead and make closing arguments. I may, I may, I may <laughs> ask to get some case law on it. I don't know. Go ahead. Thank you, Judge. Do you mind if I remain seated? You may remain Thank seated. You. Um, as the court is aware, the defendant entered a plea to. But if you do, you got to move that microphone closer to you. <laughs> Thank you. As the court is aware, is that better? <laughs> There you go. Thank you. The defendant in this case has entered a plea to burglary of a conveyance with assault or battery. That's a first degree felony. Reckless driving as a lesser included misdemeanor and child neglect without great bodily harm, which is a third degree felony. We're asking the court today to adjudicate the defendant guilty on all three counts and sentence her to five years in the Department of Corrections, followed by five years of probation, along with the terms and conditions outlined in our previous letter. Defendant's score sheet reflects 92.2 .2 points, providing a range of 48.15 months in Department of Corrections, up to a maximum allow allowable of life. State agreed to cap Department of Corrections time at five years. As the court is well aware and has been brought out today, downward departures are allowed if there are circumstances or factors that reasonably justify it, and it's a two-step process. First, whether the court can depart and second, whether the court should depart. Defense in this case is arguing for downward departure on a number of bases. The first is that the victim, Cyril Stubbs, was an initiator, willing participant, aggressor, or provoker of the incident. Defense has primary referen primarily referenced today incidences in their motion that include people that aren't even involved in this case, not the defendant, not the victim, not the child at issue. They also reference case or they also reference previous incidences in 2015 and 16 as well as possibly one in 2019. But in looking at this event on July 27th, 2021, Cyril Stubbs certainly was not a willing participant, nor was he a present aggressor in this criminal case. We'd ask the court to look at the messages in defense's motions and exhibits between Cyril and the defendant. They indicate that he had kept in contact with her two days prior to this incident, told her that his understanding was different as far as when he had to return the child and that he would be returning the child on the 8th. There was no attempt to hide where the child was by Mr. Stubbs. He was in contact with the defendant and she knew where her child was and when he intended to return her. Cyril believed he was able to keep custody until uh, the 8th that they had granted him an extension of a few weeks, as his messages indicate. He had also contacted DCF that morning to make a report about an iPad he had found in the child's belongings and was instructed not to return her prior to their close of investigation. The proper remedy in this case would certainly not be the self-remedy undertaken by the defendant. In looking at the present case and the facts and circumstances in front of the court, we don't believe defense has met their burden to show that Cyril Stubbs was an aggressor in this case. He certainly was not a willing participant. The second downward de departure basis offered by defense is that the offense was committed in an unsophisticated manner, that it was an isolated incident for which the defendant has shown remorse, and defense needs to prove all three of those elements with competent and substantial evidence. The first element is that her offenses were committed in an unsophisticated manner. In determining whether defendant's actions were unsophisticated, courts should consider whether the defendant would have had to go through several distinctive and deliberate steps in order to commit the offense. That's under State v. Staffney, 826 Southern 2nd, 509. This was not unsophisticated. This was planned. She drove up here with her co-defendants from South Florida, as she stated today. Her address is listed in court documents as seven hours away. Her co-defendant, Gail Gee's motion, states she staked out Mr. Stubbs' residence. 
This defendant was involved in a high-speed car chase that, that, a victim, that almost ran the victim's vehicle off the road. And at one point, the, vehicle, the defendant's vehicles were hitting Stubbs' bumper. They eventually blocked in his car at an intersection. This car chase involved two vehicles and three participants and indicated a planned, coordinated event to box in his vehicle. This defendant got out of the vehicle. As she approached Stubbs' car, she, she grabbed a tool she had brought with her, a window punch tool, and broke out the black back window over the three children sitting there in the seat. That shattered glass over those children. She also had the tool for cutting the child out of her seatbelt. Again, these were items she brought with her to the scene. This was to forcibly and violently remove the child from the vehicle. There were a number of deliberate steps taken in that sequence of events and that Alicia Gee Galloway had time to think about what she was doing and walk away from her actions, but she chose not to. It would appear her actions were not unsophisticated. Defense must also show that her actions were isolated. This defendant is being sentenced for multiple acts under one case. That would seem to defeat this factor under State v. Monroe, 902 Southern 2nd, 381. Defense also indicated it could be isolated because of her lack of criminal record. However, that has been specifically held by the Florida courts to be an invalid mitigator to justify a downward departure under State v. Goggin, 27 Southern 3rd, 111. Therefore, we don't believe that this was an isolated incident. The last prong that must be shown is that the defendant has shown remorse for her actions. Based on the state's arguments, we do not believe that defense has met the three-prong test to qualify for a downward departure on this basis as a whole. Defense also argues argue she qualifies for a downward departure because she was under extreme duress or domination of another. While there were several, several incidences discussed by Ms. Gee Galloway, they're far removed in time and that we don't believe they're relevant to what happened on July 27, 2021. On that date, there are no substantiated allegations anyone was in present danger or that Cyril was an aggressor. There's no evidence on the day of this incident he had threatened Gee or her co-defendants in any way, shape, or form. There's no proof the defendant was under any present duress or any domination. There's no allegations that anyone had placed her or Avani in danger. This has nothing to do with prior acts. Defense wants you to believe that Stubbs was the threat, but the facts do not support that. The facts support that the defendant was the threat. Further, a downward departure on this basis means that extreme duress must be proven by evidence of a present, imminent, and impending threat of force or imprisonment, which put the defendant in a state of apprehen apprehension of death or serious bodily injury if he or she didn't commit the crime. And there must have been no opportunity to escape the compulsion without committing the crime. This threat must be external, not some internal pressure, such as depression or being distraught. That's under Tooler v. State and Pooler v. State, 704 Southern 2nd, 1375. We don't believe defense has presented evidence of extreme duress or domination that would qualify under this downward departure basis either. However, even if the court believes the defendant qualifies for downward departure on some basis and the court can legally depart, their second analysis should be whether it should. And the state submits it should not. A lot has been said today about the defendant's needs, but the purpose of criminal courts is not to rehabilitate the defendant. It's to protect the public and hold her accountable for her actions. Judge of the three co-defendants, Alicia Gee Galloway was the common denominator, if you look at the facts. This was about her ex-boyfriend and her child. And her two co-defendants are the people who would do anything in the world for her, her mother and her husband. Defense's own motion and witnesses regarding defendant's character admit that they are not recognized mitigators. In addition, in their motion, they claim that she had hurt no one with her actions. State would submit that is incorrect. 
She and her co-defendants terrified the five people in that vehicle, including three children. The PSI noted she was a former guardian ad litem, so as someone who frequently works with children, she should understand that better than most. One of the other children in the back seat also had some scratches and scrapes from the window glass shattering over her. Lastly, a lot has been said today about custody of AS. Thankfully, all parties left her out of these criminal proceedings. But I'd like to remind the court of the impact on her due to all of this. In addition to some scrapes and physical injuries on her body, when she was interviewed at the Children's Advocacy Center, she was so traumatized, she first relayed that people dressed like mommy, grandma, and a man tried to take her from a car. She also met the criteria for PTSD and had to start attending regular therapy for trauma symptoms. So not only could this high-speed chase have resulted in serious injury or death to anyone in the vehicle or community, but the trauma of her mother as well as her grandmother and stepfather as the people behind this incident cannot be understated. That type of event has a profound impact on a child. For these, all of these reasons, we'd ask the court to hold the defendant accountable for her criminal actions and sentence her to five years in the Department of Corrections, followed by five years of probation. Your Honor, before you today, a successful, loving, kind, dedicated mother asking for understanding, not forgiveness. She knows she did wrong and has paid and will continue to pay a heavy price. This court is, by design, given options in sentencing. Defense believes state has taken an aggressive position concerning Ms. Galloway from the start. At first, they denied her any more contact with her child, and it wasn't until this court heard the rest of the story and intervened that she finally got to get visitation going again. And here we are today, again, state demanding a very high punishment for this defendant. We've told the court the rest of the story, and we now submit to the court's judgment. Thank you, Your Honor. We're just going to take a brief break. All rise.
Please be seated. Unfortunately, I have had occasion to reside over literally hundreds of cases involving custody and the disputes between parents over their kids. And you noted in your, or there was an argument made that you were aware of the effect of this on children. This has to be the most saddest, most just complete waste for this situation to have come down to this. Got a military man and woman who's had no criminal background and this is what it comes to in your face with an f1 felony one state capped this sentencing hearing at five years you had a maximum of life imprisonment life that's how severe this case was. One of the saddest cases I've had to deal with. Court, um, the um, minimum guidelines is 48.150 months in, in the state prison. Court finds that there is, based on non-statutory basis of the history in this case and the domestic violence that was, not sure it's true, but it was uncontroverted by any, any evidence otherwise, the uncontroverted evidence presented before the court today of ongoing domestic violence in the early years, I'm going to assert non-statutory basis for a downward departure I'm going to sentence the defendant to 48.15 months in the state prison and I'm going to suspend two years of it 24 months in addition there'll be two years of probation that's 24.150 months in the state prison credit for time served with 24 months of suspended sentence an additional two years of probation, applicable court costs, cost of prosecution, restitution in the amount, 6244 joint several co-defendants, Gail Gee and Michael Galloway. The court is ordering that there not be any contact between uh, the defendant and Cyril Stubbs, Keisha Theory, and I assume these are the two children, MT and MT. However, I am going to allow email, text, or telephone communication as it relates to the child. 
court is also not taking the state's recommendation for no unsupervised contact with AS. That's your child, right? Back to you, sir. I'm not. I'm not directing that there. I'm not limiting contact. That's between the state. If you've gone through a dependency action, they're allowing contact or state courts, whatever the other does that. I'm not limiting it in this criminal matter. I assume all of these things have been done if you've completed a dependency, but I'm going to go ahead and order them. Successfully attend and complete an anger management course. Enroll within 60 days of beginning probation. You can probably do it in DOC. Complete a parenting class. Comply with all DCFFFN uh, recommendations as it relates uh, to the child. Purpose of this is not to try and limit contact with the child. The child doesn't know any better. All I can say to you, I used to preach at parents all day long. About 98% of it went in one ear and out the other, and I still keep preaching. But you got to learn how to get along. Because we don't teach our kids by what we say to them. I hope you realize, yeah, you just talk to them, you tell them what to do. That's not how they learn. They learn by looking at you, by absorbing you and what you do and how you treat people. That's how your children learn. And if you all continue to have the hateful relationship, this child will be and already is severely harmed. I'm as much concerned about that as I am about you, ma'am, even though this is your sentencing. This is about your child. You didn't do right by your child by engaging in this. And you're likely, lucky, you didn't end up in prison for a long, long time. Anything else we need to do on this? Yes, Your Honor. I've asked for delayed reporting. Uh, the husband has to come back on Monday to the court and just ask if she could turn herself in on Monday. This might give her the opportunity for one more visit. For one more visit? Before, right, yes, with her child. Is that happening? Is there a visit happening? I don't know. Sorry. What's ordered? I'm not, that's not my, I'm not, I'm not the judge in that. Is there, is there, is there a visitation planned? She says that she has one schedule on Monday, Your Honor. Zoom visit? Nope. We're sentencing today. Already cut some slack today. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm sorry. Wait. Wave cost of supervision. Anything else? Mr. Clark. Did I give you the score sheet? No, sir. Um, I also need Exhibit 5. What, did, what is Exhibit 5? I did not see it, so I'm not sure. Did you hand me Exhibit 5? Yes, sir. I believe it's a letter. 